Good afternoon and welcome to our post-mission management team uh, press conference here at Kennedy Space Center. I'd like to introduce our participants that we have with us today, beginning with Wayne Hale, the Space Shuttle Deputy Program Manager, John Murator, the Manager of Shuttle Systems Integration and Engineering, and Mike Webmore, Director of Shuttle Processing at Kennedy Space Center. And we'll begin with opening remarks, starting with uh, Wayne Hale. Thank you, Bruce. Let's see, uh, I'm going to start with a little video today. Several folks ask what a uh, point sensor box looks like, and I think we've got a little video from the shuttle uh, logistics uh, depot today. Here we go. Um, this is a very exciting black box, as we call them in the uh, business. Um, I, I don't have the dimensions memorized, but I think we've got them available for you there. There is what we call a motherboard, just uh, like a computer backplane uh, motherboard that you plug the other cards into, uh, looking at the slots that the uh, various cards plug into uh, at the bottom of that. Here's the box again with the top off, no cards in it, just uh, backplane. You can see all the little um, electronic slots that the cards plug into. Um, here we have a uh, gentleman at the Logistics Depot uh, looking at one of the cards, making sure it's uh, all checked off for the paperwork, putting it into the checkout equipment that checks out the function on that particular card, where they do uh, card level checks, going through the tests with the uh, equipment there. Um, that's uh, that's about as exciting as it gets uh, when you're dealing with the black boxes. Um, today, uh, um, we're going to have a little bit of discussion about the troubleshooting that we've done. I think the, the short answer on the troubleshooting is the simple things, the things that we did quickly. Um, yesterday, last night, uh, did not uh, provide us any resolution to the problem. I'm sure you've already heard that. Um, at, at about noon today, uh, the launch director uh, and uh, the leaders of the testing team and I had a, had a discussion about uh, how we stood for weekend testing. And uh, at the launch director, uh, Mike Leinbach's uh, um, recommendation, we decided that we were keeping the launch countdown team um, occupied more than they needed to be. We have certain elements of the team, obviously, that are involved in the troubleshooting. And they will remain involved in the troubleshooting. But there's a large number of folks around the Kennedy Space Center that uh, were not involved with the troubleshooting. And we were keeping them tied up. So to allow them to have the weekend off, we have backed out of the uh, countdown configuration, released uh, those folks that are not involved in the troubleshooting from support around the clock in the firing room uh, for the weekend. Um, that uh, doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of people working. John Muratore is going to talk a little bit about all the folks that are working here uh, and around the country all throughout the weekend to uh, resolve this problem. We're going into a, a more extensive set of tests, so we've already started those this afternoon. They'll go on overnight. Um, we will come back tomorrow uh, in engineering reviews and review the data. Um, then at, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, we'll have another mission management team review to review the outcome of that testing. We have another round of testing planned to go on through Sunday. We'll follow the same routine Sunday. Um, and so forth until we discover the problem and fix it. Um, right now, uh, rather than give you a launch date, I'm going to tell you what our, what our real status is. We are going forward on a day-by-day -day basis. We have got the entire resources of the agency behind us to troubleshoot this problem. Uh, as soon as we find the problem, we will immediately move out to fix the problem. And as soon as we have fixed the problem, we will be four days from launch. And everybody's going to know, ask, want to ask, what is that date going to be? Well, I don't know. It depends on how quickly we can find the problem and fix it. Uh, and we will be back here to tell you all about that. And certainly no later than Monday, uh, we'll be back to answer any questions that you have. But right now, we are on a day-by-day -day basis until we find and fix the problem. Um, I did talk with the, uh, with the director of flight crew operations. The crew is staying here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it's possible that we could be back in the countdown and, and looking at a launch in the latter half of the week, but that would uh, require a very near-term uh, lucky find still. Uh, and as we get into the more detailed testing, uh, we obviously are moving into fixes that might take longer. But we are not, in any sense of the word, uh, becoming pessimistic about making the July 
launch window. We are here for the duration. Uh, we're committed to uh, giving this the uh, good old college try until we get the problem resolved. I think that's all I've got for an opening statement, John. Would you like to take over from there? Sure. Uh, one of the more difficult problems in uh, aerospace vehicles is finding transient problems, problems that only occur under a certain set of conditions. And you know, we've all had cases where we got cars that wouldn't start first thing in the morning or wouldn't start in wet weather. And you have a lot of trouble trying to isolate and find those kind of problems. And because when you take the car into the shop, it's working fine. And uh, it's uh, really hard for people to try to understand it. You can't fix things until you know why they're broke. And so uh, what we've been doing is we have been uh, working very diligently to try to understand what are the set of conditions that are causing this problem so we can recreate it, isolate it, and eliminate it from the system. To do that, we have 12 teams of people working across the country. They're going to work all weekend. We have engineering tag-ups scheduled Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And we're planning to go uh, basically every day until we uh, have got the problem identified and isolated and the solution and work. We're very fortunate in that we had the whole program and, in fact, the whole agency geared up to support the mission. So everybody was set to work for 14 days straight. And so we're in, you know, in, in day three of this. And so we've got uh, everybody had sort of planned to be in a mission support mode. We have all the facilities up all around the country, all the test facilities, all the communications facilities all the control centers and all the computers. And so we're taking advantage of all of that to go hammer away at this problem. Um, and uh, that's really all I've got to say. OK, John. Um, Mike, would you like to open with something? Just a little bit to add. Uh, Wayne, Wayne basically mentioned that uh, at our request, he authorized us to complete the scrub securing today. And uh, that process will go through tomorrow. Basically, the fuel cells were already shut down. Uh, we'll complete securing of the uh, equipment that supports them on the ground side, as well as destowing some of the crew equipment, uh, restoring the facility to its normal mode, such as putting up handrails uh, so we can have routine access to the pads, putting up uh, foreign object debris collection cones, putting up safety equipment that is normally removed from the pad during countdown to ensure it's not a debris source, and, and uh, also reinstalling some vent port plugs on the orbiter until such time as we're ready to restart the, the countdown. Uh, basically, once that is complete, about midday tomorrow, uh, our primary job will be to support the troubleshooting team that John is leading. And um, as soon as they've completed that troubleshooting, then we'll start the four-day process of getting back to a launch. Okay, thanks. And we'll take some questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone and give me your name and affiliation. And uh, let's get the mic right down here. Hands, anybody? Marcia, right here? All right. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for um either of Wayne or John probably. Um, you've had three months already to stew over this problem. And uh, <laughs> I know you have more resources you're putting toward it, but it's after three months, I'm just wondering what, I mean, you must, I'm wondering what your hope level is to be able to come up with a solution in a week or two when it's already been three months and you haven't come up with anything. You know, um, we had a problem during the first tanking test. We worked very hard to eliminate it. During the second tanking test, everything worked absolutely fine. Uh, we did. A, we went beyond that, continuing to examine the boxes we pulled out of the ship, the wires we pulled out of the ship, and in the end, it came to our best judgment that. We'd done everything we could. We couldn't, when we admitted quite clearly that it was unexplained, but we thought that we had eliminated the problem by swapping the hardware out and the wiring out, and we were going to continue to try to understand and investigate that. Um, we have this problem. It's not clear that the problem is at all linked to the problem that we had during the first tanking test. Well, on the other hand, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, we uh, are doing work today to try to better emulate the flight environment. You know, it's, uh, it's very difficult because when, we, when this problem occurred, we had all the equipment in the vehicle up, all the systems up. We had uh, cryogenics loaded into the system. We had all of the communication systems up, the radars hitting on the vehicle, the radio communication systems up. Uh, it was a very complex environment, electrically, electromagnetically, thermally. Uh, in some places, the vehicle was hot. In some places, the vehicle was cold. Um, and so consequently, it's a very complex environment to try to identify a transient problem. 
So what we're doing is is that we've pulled out all the stops and we are doing everything we can in a high fidelity way to put the vehicle into that configuration and try to understand and try to track the problem. And then when we trap it, we can isolate it and we can eliminate it. I'd like to follow up on that. I would say that I'm very hopeful because we're taking this troubleshooting to a significantly higher level than we took it the first time. The first time through, we didn't involve nearly as many folks. We didn't have the data as well coordinated as we have it now. Uh, and I think that we have taken the troubleshooting to a significantly uh, more impressive uh, plane, and, and I feel very confident that we will get a solution to our problems. Now, it's not out of the woods yet. I don't want to mislead you, but I'm very hopeful. Good, thank you. Uh, Bill? Bill Harwood, CBS, for one of you two guys, I'm not sure which. And I apologize if the premise in here, if I've got something wrong, and if it does, part of the reason for asking is so you can correct me. Um, but given your history, I couldn't find a single engine cutoff in flight failure in the history of the program. There have been some filling sensors, I guess, that have failed in flight or electronics, but not a cutoff sensor. And given that you've made 452 cutoff sensor flights, if you want to look at it like that, without a single in-flight failure, in my understanding, the logic is you got to have three failed wet to kill that system or two failed dry after it's armed. Why do you need four? Why can't you go fly with three? Well, you know, Bill, you're asking a very good question, and, and folks are going to go off and look at that discussion if, in fact, we can't solve the problem. But the first thing we are going to do is try to find out why this one isn't working and fix it. Uh, if, if we, have, we have not... No, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. We did some more history. Early in the program, uh, in STS 1 through 6, we had a number of problems with point sensors. Uh, they, they had, uh, I, I believe, a couple of those were engine cutoff sensors in flight that had problems. And we completely redesigned the system at that point. New manufacturer, new design. Since then, we've not had any engine cutoff sensor problems, we have had some of the, uh, as you pointed out, point sensors that are used at the top of the tank to see when the tank is full have experienced some problems. Um, and, and so we would say that we fixed that initial problem we had in the early days, okay? But um, I, I tell you what, going down the logic path, one of our safety requirements on this vehicle is that we are too fault tolerant in our electronics. We can take two failures and continue to keep on flying safely. And um, anytime you step away from that standard, you incur risk, and you better make sure that you have a really airtight story to step away from that uh, posture. So, again, um, if we get to the end of all this troubleshooting and, and everything is working fine, we may come around to discussion of, well, what if? Uh, but we're not ready to go there yet. Okay, Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, to follow up on Bill's question there, Wayne, are you saying there could come a time that you would consider flying with three as it is now? And uh, also, we did have a shutdown of an engine on Ward Bridges' flight. I don't know what that had to do with the sensor. And also, uh, this four days, which I'm getting to my question now. <laughs> The four days, you say you have four days after you fix the problem. Is that correct? In other words, not when you discover it, but after you fix it, then you need four days. Correct? Right. So let me see the three questions in there. Yes. After we fix the problem, it's it's four days. One day to close out the AF, three days from call to station, countdown to launch. Um, the uh, failure of the engine, it wasn't an engine failure, it was an instrumentation failure on STS-51F back in I believe it was June or July of 1985. Lloyd Bridges was the pilot on that flight. Gordon Pullerton was the commander. Uh, was caused by a faulty temperature sensor inside the engine. The engine thought it was overheating and shut, and the, and the safety system shut it down. A completely different set of sensors than these low-level cutoff sensors in the tank. And uh, the third question was, I, I think I'm doing my answer. John, you, it's your turn. <laughs> I think that we need to know that the problem doesn't have implications for more sensors. If we knew absolutely that it was just one sensor, one string of electronics, or one sensor, I think that we could have a really good discussion about do we feel comfortable with three or four. Given the robustness of the software 
and I think that we could have a really good discussion. We might get comfortable with that. I think that until we know that the same problem can't pop up in two other sensors, we need to keep troubleshooting. So I think that's it. I think the concern is that there's a common cause and it could cause us to, to compromise more of the system once we lift off and put it in the full flight environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman this side of uh, Jay, right here. John Johnson, LA Times. So are you saying, based on what John just said, that this time you're committed not to leaving it as an unexplained anomaly? Gosh, our, our, we are putting a full court press on this to resolve this anomaly. I, I, if you come to the end of all our testing and, and we've done everything that we can do and changed out everything that we can change out and it's still unexplained, then we've got to sit down and talk about our rationale to go fly. Uh, that's the process. Um, we never want to fly with unexplained anomalies. We always want to explain our, our problems and resolve them. I mean, that's the principle, that's the gold standard that you go for. Um, unfortunately, life is always, not always so kind to give you a problem that you, that you can find a solution to, and then you talk about it. I think that there's a risk. What you need to understand is every time we go in a ship to do something, there's risk. And we have to do a risk versus risk trade. If we tear into this, this system this way, what's the risk of damaging something that will be very hard to repair, damaging something we can't detect? There's a risk with every action we take. And so what we do is we balance the risk of not taking action versus the risk of taking action. And when we completed all the troubleshooting after the second tanking test and the anomaly wasn't there, and that was on eco sensors three and four, and we took the boxes and all the wire that we pulled out and did full examination on all of that, and we couldn't identify a problem, okay? We said to ourselves, what's the value of going back in and tearing into the system to try to further absolutely identify the cause of the anomaly versus the risk of damaging component systems and potentially breaking something else that maybe we might not detect? And so we had to do that risk versus risk trade. I think we made a good risk trade before, and I think we're making a good risk trade now. And right now, the risk trade is keep working on it. And if we get to the point where the risk trade says it doesn't make sense to tear into the system anymore, we've, we've eliminated everything we can, and it's way too much risk to people and equipment to continue to try to troubleshoot it, then we're going to have to face a discussion about whether or not it should remain unexplained. I'm going to the lady on the second row right here. Wait for, yeah, wait for the mic, please. Okay. Dita Pass with the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. Given a possible worst case scenario um, where the launch schedule would have to be pushed back to September, can you talk a little bit about its impact for Atlantis and how that would work? Well, I, you know, everybody wants to jump to the end of this game. I, 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 we're here working hard this weekend and, and I am very hopeful that we will find something in the next couple of three days and get off the pad and go launch. If, if we don't and it stretches out, then we will move STS-114 to September and STS-121 to the November launch window and, there, and so forth until we, until we uh, get going again. But uh, I, I think we're a long way from having a serious discussion about that. Let's bring it back on this side, Irene. Um, Irene talks with the Reuters for um, it's kind of a combination of Wayne and Mike and um, it involves your overall strategy. Um, do you expect that you'll be looking at any changes to Atlantis's immediate processing to preserve the option of using the STS-121 stack for discovery in case there isn't an easy fix and you want some time left at the end of the window? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what, um, what um, I have to think about that a second, Irene. I'm not sure what there is on the 121 stack that would be better or different. Now, the orbiter uh, maybe, but you know, we had some problems with the eco sensors and the tank that's on that stack right now, or, or, or potentially that's part of the unresolved anomaly from the tanking test. So it's hard to think about a scenario where um, that stack would provide us uh, a way out. Um, what we have done is we did have a meeting today to approve the, the uh, mating of Atlantis to that stack. So we're going to go forward next week and roll uh, Atlantis from the orbiter processing facility to the VAB and, and uh, continue with our flight preparations over there. Just a follow-up to that then. Um, are you thinking at all then that this is a fleet-wide problem? Well, certainly 
until you understand what the problem is that potentially exists for a generic or fleet-wide problem, um, that's why we want to, one of the reasons why we want to resolve this, not just fix the particular problem that we're having on the, on the tank and orbiter combination that we got, but also to make sure that we don't have, you know, a fleet-wide problem that we need to go deal with. You want to add to that? No, I, I think the, the, the bottom line is, is that uh, we don't know if we're having a problem in the tank, if we're having a problem in the wiring, if we're having a problem in the electronics box. We don't know if the equipment is fine and it's just the environment that we're operating in is somehow subtly different, or we don't know if there's a, there's a problem in the equipment. And until we know that, everything is suspect. And then when we clear items by, by test and analysis, then we'll move on and decide whether we gotta, we got to deal with problems on other vehicles or, or if it's just limited to this one vehicle. Okay, Stefano. Uh, Stefano Colladam, Potera Mechanics. Um, you have four sensors, and this is this is just a theoretical question. What if you added a couple more? Well, you know that's that's uh, not a bad thought. Unfortunately, I think we'd have to do some serious modifications to the wiring and the computer program that would probably take us longer than than a couple of three weeks to do. So um, that's uh, you know something that would be a longer term kind of discussion. Okay, uh, second row, right here. Hi, uh, Ben O'Schmidt with HD News. Uh, just to go back to Mike, um, at what point will you be comfortable saying, well, we simply cannot replicate how complicated it is close to launch, two and a half hours out from launch, and we are therefore not able to replicate, in your words, the electromagnetic activity? And once you get to that point, if you do, will you then be able to have the discussion that you've all been talking about and saying, well, we just can't replicate that. And so now we move forward and say, well, can we launch without it? And secondly, uh, for anybody, are you getting any input from the White House or is there any communication going on from other folks in government? What's your take on that? <laughs> okay. So the way we do this is we build what's called a fault tree and we, say out, we lay out all the possible things that could be causing this. We had an initial fault tree uh, with the first hanging test. We've expanded that and made a greater level of detail. We are flying a team out to uh, Florida tonight that is going to be full-time working the fault tree until it's closed out. Uh, that team's going to supplement the teams that, the, that are already doing the test and analysis tasks all around the country. Um, when we get all the blocks closed out and we've got good rationale on to why all of those things could not be the cause, then we'll have to have a discussion about, well, we can't eliminate it, so is this something that we're going to be prepared to deal with? Uh, until we get to that point, uh, I can get there. You know, the, the pressurization problem we had with the tank was a tough problem to solve also. And we didn't know if the problem was in the ground system, in the orbiter, in the tank. And what we did was we built a fault tree. And, and uh, within a couple of weeks, we got to the point where there were three or four things remaining on the fault tree. And we went out and did a second tanking test. And that eliminated three more. And then that gave us the insight to go do a special ground test that said, hmm, there's something wrong with this diffuser. And then when we, we did a set of analysis after that, that's what nailed it. And uh, so. You know, you got to just work this process through, and you got to have faith that if you work the problem with integrity, you're going to get to a good solution. And then, if it, when you get to the end, if you've eliminated everything and you can't figure it out, well, then you've done everything you could do, and now you got to face a, a risk trade. Okay, thank you, uh, gentlemen in the back. Uh, John Schwartz, New York Times. To what extent, in your discussions over the last couple of days, has it come up that this could possibly be related to tank modifications post Columbia? That in fact, as you said, Mr. Murtor, that whenever you go in, you're, you're taking a risk. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, there was a flurry of excitement today when people thought they found a hard correlation to when the anomaly in the tank happened and when we were activating and deactivating some of the heaters on the tank that we added after Columbia. And right now, that doesn't look like that theory is panning out. We got a little more and more work to do, but it doesn't look like there really was that tight of correlation. So uh, we, that is a, one of the, those are prime candidates on the fault tree. We have been talking about that. We've been thinking about that. 
We talked about it and thought about it before we put the heaters on. That's why we did design reviews and design certification reviews. We had teams looking at electromagnetic interference, thermal effects, wiring. We had teams looking at all that when we designed it, and we're going over all that ground again. Okay, thank you, Mike. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel for um, Wayne. A couple of questions. Um, first off, how seriously are you considering, you being the program, considering uh, extending the window out uh, for another four or five days, and what does that cost you in terms of uh, ET SEP um, lighting and photography? And secondly, um, have there ever been any instances uh, in the program's history where the uh, eco sensors actually shut off the engines? On Colonel Collins's first mission, was that an eco sensor engine shutdown on that? And if so, have there been any others? Okay. Um, first of all, we did ask uh, the uh, Flight Operations Integration Team and, and Mission Operations uh, Space and Life Sciences back in Houston to take a look uh, once again at the lighting. Um, that is that is the close of the launch window at the end of July. Um, they're off doing a study to come back and tell us what the implications of extending a few days into August would be. I don't have those in hand today. Um, early next week we should have those so we can have that discussion if um, if uh, we need to. Um, certainly in this business it pays to keep all your options open and to understand how hard your constraints are. Basically what we want to get out of that lighting is good photography of the areas that we did different things to the external tank foam um, to make sure that it stayed on all the way through ascent. So that is very important to us and we set a goal to our flight test requirements document to get good photo documentation of all of those areas in the first two flights. So presumably if we gave up some of that on the first flight that would make it mandatory for the second flight. So we've got to have those discussions ahead of us. Um, to my recollection, and I, I polled the community on this, we've had two cases where the uh, cutoff sensors have in fact caused us to shut down. The first case was STS-51F, which was the, the case we were talking about uh, earlier, uh, where the engine shut down and back in the uh, late summer or fall of 1985. Um, that, because the in, we had a main engine shut down early, uh, erroneously, but shut down nonetheless, you have a performance impact and they in fact cut off several tens, uh, maybe about 100 foot a second something on the order of 60 miles an hour short of the desired velocity. So that was the first case that we had a, a, a shutdown, a main engine cutoff command issued through these cutoff sensors. The second case, as you remember quite correctly, was STS-93, Colonel Collins' first flight, where we had three or four um, incidents happen that affected the performance of the main engines. Um, you recall we had a um, box post pin come out and that's a whole other discussion that, that caused a, a very small hydrogen leak, very small in, uh, in absolute terms, but large enough to cause a loss of uh, fuel there, plus uh, a couple of things that went on the engine controllers following the electrical problem that we had during that launch that caused us to cut off. And my recollection is that was somewhere between 10 and 20 feet per second short, which is a very minor shortfall from the desired velocity and it was not a problem to the Chandra uh, X-ray telescope deploy. So those are the two cases that are on the history books for uh, cutoffs that were properly triggered by these slow-level sensors. Okay, right here against the wall. Hi, Peter McMahon, Discovery Channel Canada. Uh, question for any of you guys. I'm wondering, after 20 years, how well do you know the space shuttle? In other words, you've had, uh, or people have had 20 years plus to get to know the system as a whole, SRB's orbiter, tank and all, um, how well, are you guys disappointed at all in your ability to to anticipate things like, like these little problems coming up? It seems like some missions there, there are more of these than, than in past missions. So I'm just wondering for any of you guys, um, do you, do you think 20 years has been enough to get to know the whole system? It's near the end of the, it's near the end of the program almost. Um, how do you feel about what you, you know about the space shuttle to prevent things like this? You're trying? Yeah. Uh, Otto Lilienthal in the late 1800s said, to design a flying machine is nothing, to build it is not much, to fly it is everything. 
uh, we've had this system 20 years, but we've flown it 114 times. And every time it's flown, it's been a little bit different. And there isn't a lot of experience with uh, aging, with having spacecraft that have had this long an operational life. Um, the original design specs were for 10 years and 100 missions each. And we're running about 30 missions each on each vehicle, and, and they've been operating for 30 years. So they've been changing all through that time. And so we continue to learn about them as we continue to fly them. This is really important. There are plenty of systems out there uh, that fly for a lot longer than that. Uh, and uh, uh, the B-52 fleet that's out, and we have young men and women flying on all around the world today, is way older than that. Uh, but uh, they are operating out of a basis of a long history of understanding how aircraft age and how you take care of them. So I think that uh, we're in the research and development business, and we're still in a research and development activity, and we're learning every day in this system. It changes every day, and we have to be vigilant on it. And uh, I think that's what we're here to do. And is it frustrating? Uh, on, on occasion, this is one of them. Thank you. I guess if I can add one thing. Sure, go ahead. Since our job here is to test and check out the vehicle and ensure it's ready to fly, I, I just emphasize that the, the rigor that we do that checkout with, the number of hours that we spend getting each vehicle ready, is based on the fact that we know we don't know everything about the vehicle. Uh, the fact that this anomaly was found on a planned test during the countdown um, says, in this case, uh, I'm disappointed it failed, I'm disappointed we didn't fly, but I'm pleased that we had the proper tests planned to catch this anomaly so that we didn't just fly with a failed sensor without being aware of it. So we do learn things every single flow, but but in fact, you know, there's a silver lining to this cloud, and that is the fact that we had the appropriate test planned to screen for this failure. It caught the failure, and we took the appropriate action on, on launch day to stop and go back and begin the troubleshooting process. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Uh, Mark Carruth from the Houston Chronicle. I have a couple of questions. You showed us a picture of the point sensor box. It didn't say anything else. Uh, what does that guy do? And um, how much of a suspect is that right now? And where have you come in tracing a suspect from yesterday to today? And my second question, Mr. Mortor, I'm sorry, is could you explain about these 12 teams? Who, you know, who's involved in this, and what are the 12 things they're doing to try to get you home? OK. The second one's a little easier. We'll, we'll start with that. Um, we have teams, first of all, we have a team that's working to test and check out. It's probably the most direct team. It's, it's working on developing test and check out procedures and, uh, and basically isolating the problem and working its way through it. That team is largely based here at, with the skills in the test and check out team here, but is being augmented by skills at Kennedy, uh, skills, skills at Johnson and Marshall from the design centers and uh, from uh, the other NASA centers, Goddard, um, and Ames, and Langley were on the line today. Um, we have a team that is trying to do an analysis of all the we have two teams analyzing the thermal conditions in the tank and in the box in the vehicle. We have a team chasing down everything that's changed on the spacecraft that is related to these functions. We have a team that's off looking at we call them the chase the box team, follow the box that is following the history of this box all the way back to the time it was manufactured in the early 1980s. Um, we have the team building the fault tree. Uh, we have the te a team doing circuit analysis. Um, we've, got a, a, we've got a team looking at electromagnetic interference. Um, we have teams chasing down the history of all the parts in the tank. Um, we have a team trying to figure out how to, rep how to get a new spare ready as soon as we understand what the problem is. Um, so that, I, think that's, I think that's almost all. Um, in terms of where we've located it to, what we do in a situation like this is uh, it turns out, we look at the, the system, and it turns out the LOX ecosensor and the liquid oxygen tank and the liquid hydrogen ecosensor are on the same card of electronics. And so um, what we did was we identified, but the LOX sensor is working just fine. So we took and chased the uh, through the signal through, and the first place where the oxygen and the hydrogen sensor branch off, we start the search there. 
So basically everything downstream of that all the way to the tank is what we're still working. We didn't discover that about the card and the way the card was architected until we did the circuit analysis yesterday. Um, so uh, we've chased it down to one of the 24 cards in the box. And uh, we are now on part of the card. We know which transistors, resistors are involved uh, and other uh, components. And that's, we've got the team focusing, doing computer-based circuit analysis, starting there. And then we're looking at the wiring and the connections in the vehicle from that point on. And then looking into the history of the components in the tank that are affected, that are part of that trail. So, you know, we've, we've worked it down from the computers. You know, you start with, we saw it on a ground display. Is there something in the ground computers? We've determined that's not the case. Is it something in the onboard computers? We've determined that that's not the case. Is it something in the way we acquire the data between the point sensor box and the onboard computers? That's not the case. And then you start working inside the, the point sensor box, and we started working our way down. And uh, that's what we're working through, and that's the kind of thoroughness that we're taking through. Well, is that a, I mean, is the point sensor box sort of a leading suspect? And nobody's really been able to explain what it, what it does. It seems like it's sort of like a traffic cop or something in this whole thing. I, I don't really know what the analogy is, but could you explain? Sure. Um, well, let's, let's well, okay. Why don't you try? Let's try this. Okay. The, the way the point sensors work is they're a platinum wire bridge, and what you're looking at is the resistance in that wire, which changes with with temperature. So when it gets immersed in a cryogenic liquid, it gets a lot colder. The resistance changes when when the, when the liquid level falls below that uh, that sensor. Um, the temperature goes up, and the resistance changes again. The point sensor box is the electronics that then converts that resistance reading into a wet or a dry signal, OK? So it takes electricity going from the point sensor box out to the sensor itself. And then the point sensor box has got electronics that's looking uh, at, at the resistance and saying, OK, if it's this much, it's wet. And if it's that much, it's dry. Um, and then there are these test circuits also in this box that allow you to go in and, and emulate or send different electrical signatures down to the uh, sensor to, to see if it's really working or not. So, so all of this, I'm not an electrical engineer, so it's easier for me to explain it in layman's terms. All of this, all this uh, um, stuff that's going on in the box is to allow you to to measure whether or not there is liquid in the bottom of the tank, whether at that point in the very bottom of the tank you have uh, uncovered the sensor, these series of sensors or not. I, I hope that helps. Now, you, you want to do the electrical engineering? No, no I think okay. you did great. I'm, okay. That's a great explanation of it. Suspect that. Well, yeah, obviously it is a complicated box, okay? there. You looked at the card and there's lots of components on those cards. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in the box. If it's not in that box, then you're left with, OK, do we have a, an open circuit in the wiring? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly not a con continuously break in the wire. There may be a connector that is, it gets cold or thermally stressed, maybe pulls apart a little bit, and the wires come apart a little bit. That, that maybe is the, one of the other sources. The, the other thing is the sensor itself. The sensors have been very reliable. They're checked out. Um, and they, they, uh, that doesn't seem to be the problem. But until you go through the, the, the steps to check them all out, you don't know. And that's some of the work that we're doing this weekend. But you've got to say, yeah, the point sensor box is the most complicated box. So just, just common sense tells you you ought to go look really hard at the most complicated part of the system uh, with the particular interest. We've had uh, three hours of discussion yesterday. The troubleshooting team, three hours today. And after six hours of discussion, I can tell you I can find a set of engineers will tell you it's every component between the signal conditioning card and the point sensor box all the way to the sensor of the tank. And what you all agree is the best way to get to an answer is to not pick, uh, not pick and say, ah, that's the, it's, this is the suspect. And it's the best thing to do is keep an open mind, work each of them equally hard, and see where the data leads you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Todd, we're going to let you. Uh, Ask the last question here. Okay, um, I got two of them. Todd Halverson of Florida today. First of all, I wondered if uh, Wayne or John could elaborate on the uh, what exactly you'll be doing in terms of testing over the weekend, and uh, what capabilities you have to uh, actually test systems that have displayed intermittencies. 
The other one's a more philosophical one. If you have a system that's acting intermittently, it's working sometime and not working another time, how can you be certain that uh, the system won't fail in flight even if it's operating as expected through a countdown? You got to take on the test part. Oh, okay. All right. Um, for the weekend, what we're going to go do is, as Wayne explained it to you, the resistance of the sensors changed. And, and the neat thing about resistive circuits is, is that you can break into them and put additional resistors in them. And um, what we've done is, is the, uh, we, we went ahead and, uh, and we're breaking the connection between the point sensor box and the rest of the circuits in the tank. And then we put another resistor in there and there's a box which has variable resistance set settings, and they're done in ones of ohms, tens of ohms, hundreds of ohms, thousands of ohms. It's called a decade resistor box. And we can dial the resistances in we need, and it adds to the resistance of the sensor in the, in the, uh, in the tank. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go dial that in, and that's going to enable us to change what the... Uh, what the resistance of the sensor would appear to be to the point sensor box. And that's important because the amount of current going through the box is different based on whether the bo whether the sensor in the tank is wet or cold. And heating, which can induce transient failures, is a function of how much current is being put through the box. The first thing we're going to do, uh, we're starting up uh, late tonight and we're going to work through tomorrow, is to just work on sensors number one and two because they're the easiest to get at. And we'll compare the performance of sensor one, which was good, to that of sensor two, which had a transient on it. If that doesn't really give us an answer, we're going to break in to a place a little more intrusive in the wiring, and we're going to bring up a full-up simulator that simulates all of the sensors in the tank, and we're going to manipulate them all to try to get the exact current profile and heating profile in the box emulated. And uh, that's what we're going to go do, and we're going to try to keep the sensors in the tank in the line as much as possible and add the resistances in in order to, to get the uh, kind of response out of the box that we expect. Okay. Well, talk about the transient. Well, I, I think we owe, owe uh, Todd the second half of the which is the philosophical question of um, what was it again? Philosophy. Uh, well, that, the short answer to that is you don't know that it won't operate, won't fail again in flight, and that's why we would really like to find the cause to this. Uh, and only after you have done everything you possibly can to find the cause would you ever consider flying with something, and I, and I use the word consider very appropriately because we would consider at that time after we've done all the testing. But well, we're off to try to find this problem and, and solve it, not fly with some unexplained situation. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time around. Thanks, Thanks. Bundesstaat Florida haben eine große Wasserhose in der Nähe von Punta Gorda ausgelöst. Die Wasserhose zog langsam einen Fluss hinab und wurde von atemberaubenden Blitzen begleitet. Nur kleinere Sachschäden wurden gemeldet. Augenzeugen berichten, der Twister hätte 16 Minuten lang gedauert und am Boden einen Durchmesser von ca. 60 Metern gehabt. Verzögerung. Die Raumfähre Discovery wird nach Angaben der NASA frühestens Ende nächste Woche ins All aufbrechen können. Zu kompliziert ist der Fehler zu beheben, der sich in die Treibstoffanzeige eingeschlichen hat. Aus diesem Grund war der ursprüngliche Starttermin am vergangenen Mittwoch geplatzt. Sollte die Discovery nicht bis zum 31. Juli abgehoben haben, ist ein Starttermin erst wieder ab dem 9. September möglich. Malfunction delaying the highly anticipated launch of the space shuttle Discovery. The U.S. Space Agency scrubbed the mission, the first in over two years after a pre-flight test Wednesday showed a problem with a sensor in the hydrogen fuel tank. Right now, uh, rather than give you a launch date, I'm going to tell you what our what our real status is. We are going forward on a day-by-day -day basis. We have got the entire resources of the agency behind us to troubleshoot this problem. 
Uh, as soon as we find the problem, we will immediately move out to fix the problem. And as soon as we have fixed the problem, we will be four days from launch. Now, everybody's going to know, ask, want to ask, what is that date going to be? Well, I don't know. It depends on how quickly we can find the problem and fix it. Well, the current launch window for Discovery expires at the end of this month. The next opportunity won't be until September. And joining us to talk more about this shuttle mission is John Logsdon. He is director of the Space Policy Institute in Washington. Mr. Logsdon, is this delay really a setback, or does it just look like it to those of us in the public who see, you know, it's been a long time since, since, since the big setback, a long time since there's, there's, there's been a launch, and, and there's a closing window here? Well, it's a temporary setback. I mean, this launch of, of mission STS-114 was first going to be in March, then in May, now in July, we hope and if not in September. Uh, NASA's not going to launch it until they feel very confident that everything is in a go condition. Um, what does it say about the state of the space program, the shuttle program, if anything? I mean, there's a lot of talk right now about just how old this fleet is. Well, it says a lot about the shuttle. It, it, it just underlines how fragile and cranky and difficult to operate this vehicle is and why it will take extreme care to fly it safely for the five plus years that are left in its service life. There's a hard deadline of 2010 to replace the shuttle and, and get a new system in place. So uh, we, we have to fly it if we're going to finish the International Space Station and it has to be done with extreme care. And what is on board to replace the shuttle? A thing called the Crew Exploration Vehicle, which will only carry crew. The shuttle is a launch vehicle and a spacecraft. It carries cargo, it carries people. We probably in 1971 bit off too much in one bite. So uh, we're going to go back to a, a system that only carries crew, has an escape system, doesn't use advanced technology, just does the job well. But wasn't, I mean, you say, you know, bit off more than, more than you can chew. I mean, wasn't that the idea, though, that you could have this, you know, this multi-purpose space vehicle? Is that notion really, really off the table for, for the future, do you think? Well, not for the longer-term future. I would say even the mid-term future. But we weren't ready to do this in, in, in the early 70s. Uh, the United States was coming out of the experience of sending people to the moon. There was a certain engineering arrogance that we could do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, two accidents uh, have, have tempered that arrogance to the point where we realize now that we don't have the technology in hand to build a reusable multi-purpose vehicle. So let's build a good one uh, to get people in and out of space. So if we know how crew will be transported in the future after, after 2010, what about cargo? Well, depends on the size of the cargo. We have a lot of so-called expendable launch vehicles uh, that are used to launch communication and scientific and military satellites. They're already available. When we go back to the moon, and that's uh, on tap for the next decade, we're going to have to build a large launch vehicle that can carry uh, 100 tons or more into Earth orbit. Uh, that's a vehicle to be developed, but, but we've got plenty to carry cargo to the space station. Uh, so wh what happens if, if the window on, on this launch for Discovery uh, expires and it has to be bumped till September? What, what implications does that have for uh, what's going on in the space station? Well, uh, the space station will be in fine shape. Uh, we've been totally dependent on our Russian allies. Uh, since the Columbia disaster in February of 2003, uh, a, a supply ship, a Russian supply ship called Progress, uh, was up there recently. Uh, so the crew is in no danger and they can continue on with their work. Uh, the rules set up after the accident, Columbia accident, were that the shuttle has to be launched in daylight. And that happens only every other month. So that's why if we don't make the July launch window, we have to uh, wait till September. And we can wait. All right. John Logston, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is today's briefing on the outcome of this afternoon's mission management team briefing here at the Kennedy Space Center. Here to discuss today's meeting and the future course that we'll be following for the launch of STS-114 
is Bill Parsons, the Space Shuttle Program Manager at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Wayne Hale, the Space Shuttle Deputy Program Manager at the Johnson Space Center. Ed Mango, the Director, the Deputy Director of the Orbiter Project Office at Johnson Space Center. And Mike Wetmore, the Director of Shuttle Processing at the Kennedy Space Center. And we'll begin first with Program Manager Bill Parsons. Bill? Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, this morning, uh, we got some pretty sad news, and I, I wanted to uh, share this with you. Um, one of our the Space Shuttle Program in the Marshall Space Flight Center, one of our brightest uh, uh, a lady named Lisa Roberts passed away. She was only 43 years old. She's a tech assistant for my deputy program manager at the Marshall Space Flight Center, Mike Goffey. And we just wanted to say our hearts and our thoughts go out to her family. This is a very, very sad news. Um, to get started with, what I'd like to, to tell you all is, uh, in the beginning, um, we were in the countdown. We had the mission, manage mission management team in place. And I decided after we uh, came out of the uh, the count to keep the mission management team in in place and to allow them to go through the uh, completion of all of this uh, troubleshooting and and resolution of this problem. I think it was uh, a, the best thing that we could do, and it was a, a decision that I made. We could have gone back into program mode and, and made decisions more traditionally within the program, but I felt like that uh, keeping Wayne Hale and the mission management team intact and involved was uh, was the right thing to do, and they've done a great job. I would also uh, say that, you know, it's difficult to find a, a glitch that, that won't stay glitched. And, and uh, that was a note that I got from, uh, from Mike Griffin. He, he's uh, staying in contact with us. He's keeping a, an eye on what we're doing. But right now, I can tell you that we're still looking for uh, the problem, and, we, and they'll tell you more about that. I would also say that uh, we've waited uh, two-plus years, two-and-a-half years to be here. Uh, we're trying awfully hard to resolve this issue. But we had a window that extended from July 13th through July 31st. Um, that we're still in that window. We're still trying to uh, to launch within that window, and this team is doing everything they can to to give us every opportunity to launch in the July window. So uh, we lost a couple of days uh, so far as we've done our troubleshooting. We're going to continue down this path, but. Every, uh, the intention of this program at this particular time is to try everything we can to, uh, to make this opening window. So I would just tell you that that is still our goal as we, uh, as we set out from here today. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Wayne and let him uh, give you some uh, further updates. Thanks, Bill. Um, a colleague of mine out on the West Coast sent me a um, encouragement quotation um, the other day. He said, uh, Ben Franklin, I guess it's probably Paul Richards Almanac, sounds like him. Energy and persistence conquer all things. Well, I can tell you this team is persistent and it's energetic and we will conquer this problem too. Um, we have been working for two and a half years to return the shuttle flight, and as Bill said, a few days more um, when it's all said and done to make sure we're flying safely is uh, not a problem in the bigger scheme of things. Um, we uh, set on a course uh, last week after the countdown scrub to do all the troubleshooting that we could do at the ambient condition, temperature conditions. Um, we thought that we would have, uh, or at least the guys predicted we would have all that troubleshooting done by today, by Monday, as they worked um, over the last few days. They have identified some more tests and things have run just a tad slower in some cases than they predicted. So now we think those ambient tests are going to continue through uh, Wednesday, maybe with midday Wednesday. Um, and Ed Mango, in just a minute, is going to give you the details on what we have done and what we're planning to do. And our, our number one goal here is to find this problem and fix this problem. That's what we'd like to do. Um, and that's what all our testing is uh, going forward. To date, we have not found it, so we're not able to fix it. Um, the next step, if we are unfortunate in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours, um, is to consider going to cryogenic temperatures, that is to say reload the external tank and see what happens uh, at those cryogenic temperatures. Uh, we're going to let the team concentrate um, on the ambient testing um, and see if they can find something here in the next couple of days. 
Also, uh, the uh, analysis teams that are looking at circuit analysis, they had all of the history, and we have records going back to before the first shuttle launch on similar sensors, similar black boxes, and so on and so forth. Uh, all of that work is uh, going forward, and we expect that to complete, uh, again, probably tomorrow, most of it, a little bit maybe into Wednesday. Once we get to that point, if we still have not found anything, then we need to go to the next level, and that's the cryogenic level testing. Uh, today at the mission management team, we reviewed the timelines to support that, and we think the, uh, the next opportunity to tank the vehicle would be no earlier than Tuesday. Tuesday, that's the 25th, the 26th, sorry, the 26th. And um, so that would be uh, the direction that we would put a, be putting our efforts. And there is some debate as to uh, whether or not we could, in fact, do the kinds of tests that we would need to do in, at cryogenic temperatures in a launch countdown and go ahead and launch that day, or whether we need to just do a test, um, detank, recycle, think about the data. So that uh, decision is before us. But the next thinking would be no earlier than Tuesday. Again, hopefully in the next 24 to 48 hours, we will find the, uh, the, the glitch that has got us all uh, confused or frustrated or pick your adjective and be able to fix it and go forward. Uh, uh, but I think Tuesday is probably the earliest day that we would be looking for a launch, even in that optimistic case. So given that data, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Mingo. Ed's been leading the troubleshooting team. Uh, John Muratore and Ed have been uh, trading duties. Uh, John has been looking out across the 12 troubleshooting teams. Ed has been concentrating on the troubleshooting going on on the vehicle. And uh, we're going to let Ed tell you a little bit about what they've done and what they have planned to do and how we're closing methodically off the blocks in the factory. Thanks, Lee. Uh, our goal is to figure out a path to go find a problem and then uh, obviously try to correct the problem. In order to do that, uh, after we have gotten into an ambient temperature state here, we put together a number of uh, chapters, if you want to call them, uh, to go do a series of troubleshooting uh, steps. The first of those was to go check out the aft compartment uh, and its sensors uh, prior to ever entering the aft compartment. All that was done last week, and there was no anomalies found there. Uh, and that, that basically became our baseline from which to go grow from in our and our path through the woods, if you want to call it. Well, the next thing we wanted to go do was try to isolate our point sensor box, and I think that we've talked about that before, our point sensor box and the rest of the system. And so we uh, basically broke that interface there, and we uh, connected up some um, electronic uh, breakout boxes at that point, and we tested out our point sensor box. Uh, to a pretty high level. For the particular eco sensors that are involved in, uh, in this particular anomaly, what we looked at was simulating a uh, cryogenic tank uh, through that system, uh, although there was obviously no cryos on board the tank, but electronically we simulated that. And all those tests passed on eco or sensor number two, which is the one we had the problem with. Again, um, no failures were found. At that point, what we're trying to do uh, is as we walk through the woods here, figure out exactly what we have what we have done and how it closes out each of the fault tree blocks that are out there. So by the time we get to launch, we've either figured out the problem and the fault tree block that's still open, um, or we can build rationale around that. Uh, and so that was mostly of what we did in Chapter 2. We also looked into the wiring in the orbiter and the wiring in the external tank and we made sure that that wiring was, uh, was good and solid, and those results also came back good. Of course, these are all at ambient conditions. Uh, we then uh, went down further to where the uh, umbilical is between the orbiter and the ET, and we broke an interface there, disconnected a, a connector there, and we connected up a, a piece of uh, hardware that we use over in the OPF to check out the system when the orbiter is in standalone condition. We basically uh, brought that out to the pad and we connected up to it and we simulated uh, our cryo load. What we saw on launch day, we simulated with this particular electronics box, all the electronics that the uh, orbiter system would see, both on the point sensor box, the wiring, uh, the loading, uh, the heat loading that we put into the point sensor box. We simulated all that uh, through the same exact timeline that we had during cryo load and during our first launch attempt. 
Uh, that was all completed uh, last evening, and that also showed that we had no failures with that. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a, we haven't found a problem. What that means to me is that from an ambient standpoint, we are closing off blocks in the fault tree that relate to ambient conditions. It doesn't mean we're done. It does mean that we are moving ahead and we are finding that we don't have a break in the wire, uh, we don't have a short somewhere, and we don't have an open, an obvious open in the system. It also shows that our point sensor box, which is a, uh, has a pretty complex sensing system and, and checkout system, if you want to call it that, uh, within the box, uh, is also working as expected, as designed. But we're also doing some wire flexing in the aft compartment. Uh, wire flexing is you go to the connector that you might be questioning, and you look at that uh, particular um, wire, and you move it you shake it, you wiggle it slightly, uh, and at the same time you have continuity going through that wire to make sure that you don't have an open or a short as you wiggle that wire, if you want to call it. Uh, those, that work was done this morning and so far has shown uh, that there is no problems with our copper path. One of the things we're going to do this evening, uh, because of one of the other teams that uh, we're working, is looking in detail at our circuit analysis. That is, the circuit analysis of the point sensor box and how that plays into the sensor itself. What we found from that sensor analysis is that uh, if we have a problem with our grounds, um, we, and a very slight problem with our grounds, we might indeed induce the type of failure that we are looking at. So we, have, we are going to power down the vehicle here later uh, this afternoon and evening, and we're going to go do a number of grounding checks uh, between the, the, the point sensor box, the sensors, and, uh, and the wiring within the orbiter and make sure that our grounds are solid. We expect them to be, but again, we want to go be very thorough and from a fault tree standpoint, go solve each of the fault tree blocks. We'll continue to do that in a power up state for some of these that, uh, some of the actual sensors that get power and that work will also be done later this evening and into tomorrow morning. Um, we're also going to do some tests, some additional tests, um, in which we check our wires for uh, resistance and, uh, and the path as the uh, current goes down those wires uh, to make sure that we don't have any problems uh, at connector interfaces uh, all the way from the uh, connection into the point sensor box all the way into the ET and back. And those tests will also be done late tonight or first thing in the morning. We're going to take a look at our umbilical harnesses, uh, visually look at those, and do some wire flexing at that point. Um, and at that point, we believe, looking at the fault tree, looking at all the troubleshooting we've done, we are able to address a huge number of uh, fault tree items that are in the fault tree. Uh, and that is a huge step forward. I would believe today we're probably about two-thirds of the way through that process of uh, identifying the test that can go uh, verify fault tree items. We've got about a third left to go, which we hope to complete, uh, as Wayne said, by Wednesday morning. At that point, we are going to take a step back, see, make sure we've completed everything we need to do as we're racing as, as best we can to complete all those things by Wednesday. Take a step back, make sure there's nothing else we got to go do, take a look at our data, and then we'll come back forward to Wayne and the mission management team and uh, tell them that we're done with our ambient checks. At that point, we'll have to have the conversation of what do we go do next. Uh, and that's where we're at with our troubleshooting strategy, and that's how our team uh, basically falls into trying to support a tanking uh, sometime early next week. All right, and thank you. We're ready to take questions now. So please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start here on the end with Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. I understand that you're passing Chapter 5. You got, I believe, is it Chapter 7 to go to? And there's something being said about a procedure of switching uh, the hookup from sensor 2 to sensor 3 or another sensor to see if that checks out, to see if the uh, sensor is bad. Uh, what do you have to do? What's required? Do you have to go to another tanking test to do this, or can you do it now? See, uh, um, Chapter 5, if you want to call it by chapters, uh, we, are, we have not started Chapter 5 yet. Those are our grounding checks, and those will uh, begin here later today and be completed by sometime tomorrow. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, rewiring the sensors, there is options that we are exploring that talk about uh, can we do something with the eco wiring, uh, that is the wiring part, into the point sensor box that might help us uh, determine exactly where the cause is if we have to get to the cryo state in order to go solve the problem. 
Um, uh, and at that point, uh, we are going to make sure that when we put that eco transition together, if we have to, uh, that we're going to do it in a in a way that is extremely safe, does not compromise any of our ecosystem, does not compromise any of our flight rationale, and does not compromise any of our um, uh, launch commit criteria or our flight rules. And uh, that is the work we still have to go forward with, and obviously that's work that is independent of the troubleshooting, uh, but we're trying to do that in parallel so that we can meet up with uh, those kind of decisions later in the week. Jay, Jay, that's a proposal that's on the table. And it's one of the things that the technical community needs to go work through very carefully, and they're going off and doing that. Um, you know, we, we don't know if we could do that without doing the tanking test or not, but, but we do know that it's something that's laid out there. The technical community has brought it forward and said this is a possibility, and now they're going to go off and do all the things they need to do. So we probably won't have more information on that until a little bit later, later on. But it is, it is something out there that looks very promising, and we're going to go, go look into it. Okay. Well, so we're here with Marsha. Marsha Den Associated Press, if you opt for a standalone tanking test without a launch attempt, where does that take you into July? How much extra time does that cost? And have you given any more thought to extending the window a little bit into August? Well, let's see. We did, <coughs> pardon me, talk a little bit about that. Um, there are a couple of different options. If, uh, if you did a tanking test and you got the kind of data that you expected out of it um, and you have not proceeded to launch that day, uh, I hasten to add. Um, you could recycle 24 hours later and, and put the crew in and go launch. Um, it depends a little bit on what we do in the back end of the vehicle if we put some special instrumentation in that you have to go in and take out, take out before a launch. That adds a couple more days. If you decide you'd like to top off the uh, fuel cell reactants to give you the maximum uh, number of launch attempts, that takes a couple of days. So there, there are a, a couple of different options that you might execute. I think um, the most favored one is to try the very next day, however. And, and as far as additional days in August, um, yeah. the, you know, we, it is an option that's, again, been proposed to us. The technical community needs to go off and see what the, the puts and takes are on that. They're off doing that, and they're going to bring that back to us in a couple of days. But it is definitely an option that's uh, available to us. That, uh, and it may not be that we can get all four days. We may can get one day or two days. But, but whatever it is, we'll have to do the trades and determine if that's if that's acceptable or not. Bill, Bill Murray with CBS for I guess for Wayne. Um, barring a eureka moment, either in ambient testing or in the tanking, I'm assuming you've got to have a three to four LCC in place uh, to press ahead. Can you refresh, my, first of all, is that correct? And second of all, um, I was trying to remember the history of this, but I thought that you guys flew three or four for the first 25 missions, changed it to four or four after Challenger, and I guess wanted to go back and didn't for some reason. Uh, can you give me maybe just a little history of why it was okay before and it was changed, and then I have, believe it or not, a follow-up. <laughs> well, you know, Bill, um, first of all, I'm not going to bar a Eureka moment. I want one of those Eureka moments. That's my first goal in all of this. But, yes, your your history is right. We had uh, in place a launch permit criteria that allowed us to launch with one of the sensors failed for the first 25 flights. After Challenger, um, in the reviews after the Challenger accident, they found a commonality in the way those sensors are powered, that one failure can take out two sensors. Um, and at that point, the, because of the safety rules, they went to a four of four requirement. One of the changes which had been in work in recent years, which was approved to be put on the ships during this downtime after Columbia, was to provide redundancy in the power so that you eliminated that single failure in an electrical power supply that could take down two. So you have four independently powered sensors. And the discussion, um, which we had briefly before uh, getting into the launch count, was are we ready to go back to three or four um, as the launch commit criteria? And folks said, look, we're really busy trying to return to flight. We've got a lot of work on our plate that requires some serious thought. Let us not make that change for the first flight, we'll think about it downstream. Well, now everybody's interested in that, so we're thinking about it. And um, we had a preliminary set of discussions, very preliminary today, 
Um, so we have not come to any conclusion. There's a lot of questions and history to be resurrected, and we have a team uh, that's putting that together. Again, we'd really like to find this problem and fix it and not go to a three or four kind of rationale. Philosophically, if you didn't find anything ambient and, and you think it's obviously in the string for two, if it comes down to that, I mean, you would, if you did three or four and you assume two is down and out, you still got to have right two more failures before you would get into a keep running situation that would be bad. I mean, you'd really still have to have multiple failures to get in trouble, right? I mean, well, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out what the flaw is. That is the be. discussion. That is the discussion. And we frankly have not been through that whole discussion. So I'm not really prepared to answer it right now. But folks are doing the research and putting the argument together. And we are in the next uh, few days. Again, if we are so unfortunate as to get there, going to have that kind of discussion. Stephen? Stephen Young with SpaceFlightNow.com for Wayne. I'm wondering what you're hoping to achieve with another tanking test. You've already tanked three times. The first time you have problems, second time is fine, third time a problem. How do you know, what do you gain for doing another tanking test where it may look clear and then you go to tank for launch the next day and you get to maybe run into another sense of problem? You should have been tied into our meeting today. I think he was. I think he must have been because that was, in fact, the, the discussion is what do you gain? What would be the objectives? Um, what you gain, and, and uh, can you say if the problem doesn't reoccur, is that good enough to go fly the next day? So um, those things are being weighed. Again, I would emphasize what we've told the team to do is concentrate for the next 24 to 36, 48 hours on the ambient temperature checks, make sure that we do them all right, that we're complete, that we have gotten input from everybody. And by the way, we have had some amazing folks come back and give us input. The original designer of the point sensor box from the 1970s has come out of retirement is on our team. And we have had people from all around NASA. Uh, I got an offer from the Jet Propulsion Lab folks. They wanted to, to help if they can. So in commercial launch vehicle folks, um, the, the JAXA, uh, people have uh, have given us some information and, and advice from they learned on their H2 rocket uh, some of the problems they had with uh, low-level sensors. So we've had an amazing team uh, come together to volunteer to work on this problem. So the I, I, long answer to a short question, come back to it. We want them to concentrate for the next uh, day or two on the ambient checks to make sure we have covered the waterfront. And at that point, we will proceed into cryogenic. And, and what we would do and why we would do it and when we would do it is, uh, is a discussion that we're going to table for a day or two here. But the, the fact is, if you do make a configuration change to the vehicle, then there might be some discussions about whether you'd want to do a tanking test or not. And, and that it all, if you, if you have the exact same configuration and you've gone down the road of, of thinking about the three or four and worked out all those scenarios and you're willing to go launch with a with the same exact signature that you got, and I'm not saying we are, but if we were, well then, then you might not do a tanking test. But if you did a configuration change or made some some changes to the vehicle modification of the vehicle, you very well may want to go check those out. It, it, the community has to go work their way through that. Okay, Dan. Hey, Dan Bello from Channel Two. <clears throat> I'll address this to Wayne. Others may want to jump in. I think. Um, could, could you just talk a little bit in, in terms of describing and comparing this trouble to some of the others that have bedeviled you over the years, uh, going back earlier? Usually it seems to me you know what the problem is, and the problem is how to fix it. This, this time it's how to find it. I mean, could you sort of compare uh, some of the ones you've, you've dealt with over the years? Well, and, and I think anybody on this panel could probably provide a perspective on that because we've all been uh, dealing with launch vehicles and, and the folks that worked on Apollo tell me it's not greatly different than what they had to deal with or, 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 or before on Gemini. And certainly if you, you uh, talk to the folks over in the uh, expendable launch vehicle world, they deal with the same kind of problems. Um, I had a discussion with some some friends that came down to watch the launch, and I said, you know, my rule has never been to plan my life around the shuttle launch schedule um, because, you know, things happen. It could be the weather. It could be technical problems. It could be any number of things. Um, and, and, a, and a few days delay 
to figure out what is going on, make sure we're safe, is always the right answer. So if if you come down here and expect to run, you know, like a railroad, maybe the way a railroad used to run, you know, by the clock, on time, and you don't understand the nature or the complexity of this business, um, it is a business where you have to have patience. You have to come prepared knowing that you've got complex vehicles that sometimes require some modicum of time to troubleshoot problems. So this is not outside the previous experience. You know, I'm going to help, help okay. Ed out here a little bit, but you know, Ed probably has done more troubleshooting on this vehicle through the years than, than any of us have. I mean, we, you know, we've all worked in different various uh, uh, areas, but Ed, you may have some perspective on that because you have worked on this vehicle an awful lot. I would say that uh, this, the troubleshooting approach we're taking now is the same that uh, this team would take for any um, intermittent anomaly that, that we can't find. Uh, and we have a couple of those, each flow, that you really have to burrow down into and get into the, the meat of the system. Normally what we try to do is you, uh, when you have a, an anomaly that you can't repeat, and you want to try to get to a flight state is you end up uh, trying to replace as much hardware as you can, testing out as much hardware as you can in a, in a flight environment that's going to be used in, and you systematically go through each piece of that whole logic trail and make sure that you have rationale for every one of those pieces. And that's what we're doing this time. That's what we usually do for these type of anomalies across the board. Is it any more difficult? Well, this one is no more difficult than any others. I think uh, this one has uh, the fact that we got all the way to launch and now we're doing it versus in the OPS for other problems when you have uh, maybe a lot more time and a lot less uh, issues of trying to you know, we're, we're at the point where we're ready to fly and then you find the problem. Um, so based on that, there's a little difference there, but um, this, our path through the woods is the same we would take any time you had an unexplained anomaly, which is what we have right now, um, and you can't repeat it. Intermittents are very hard to find. And if I could just say, you know, if you're taking a trip from here to Houston and your engine light keeps going on and off, Sooner or later, you're going to get worried about it, and you're going to have to go stop and get it get it looked at. And when they're in, intermittent, when the engine lights on, it's easy to go call the repairman and have them fix it. When it's intermittent, uh, you you got to struggle a little bit harder, and sometimes it takes a couple trips to that shop before they figure out what's going on with the car. Um, obviously, we are much more complex than that, but at the same time, I think that's that's the kind of logic that you have to follow when you're trying to take a trip and make sure you get everything ready. Keith Landry, Fox 35 News Orlando, with two questions, actually, if I could. First question for Wayne. We heard a lot about the unexplained anomaly since Wednesday in the tanking test in April. This year, while NASA has been preparing for this mission, during your testing and your research, have you found any other unexplained anomalies, hard failures, or intermittent failures, either to the shuttle or the external tank, that the media or the public don't know about yet? Well, let me see. That's a pretty tall question. I would tell you, first of all, that every failure, I can say this without fear of contradiction, every failure is unexplained initially. They're all unexplained anomalies to start with, and then you go troubleshoot them, and 99% uh, of the time, plus, hopefully, you come to, you, okay, well, we had a fuse blown, or we had a wire broken, or a connection not made, or, or in a fluid system, something not tightened up quite enough to keep it from leaking, and, and, and that's good. Um, but very rarely do you come to a problem. It's not unheard of, and maybe not as rare as we'd like it to be, but very rarely do you come a problem where you say, well, we've done everything we can do. Um, we just don't know anymore. We call it an unexplained anomaly, and then it becomes a risk discussion. Now, what does the American public know about the shuttle? We have little dingleberry problems every day of the week. <laughs> uh, you know, I, there's nothing secret about that, and then we're not any different than any other launch vehicle, by the way, in that regard. Uh, you know, we, uh, we're talking a little bit about the folks that are trying to launch this weather satellite. And they've had their share of problems, but they don't seem to make the front page of the paper quite as much as we do. So there you are. 
there, I mean, there's nothing. I, we're so we're right wide out, wide open. We have all, every one of our charts. You get to see them. There's nothing that we talk about that's not on the charts. If it is not on the charts, y'all usually ask us about it when we get here. So I, I believe in anything that we have going on with this vehicle, you guys know about. And, and again, it's not from lack of trying to communicate that with you. Sometimes some of these things are, are very, very minor in nature, and we're not even even concerned about them at all. And sometimes they're big, like this one, and, and we're very concerned about them. But I think we've we've laid it out for you guys. And, and again, if you hear of anything, let us know. We'll, we'll answer it for you. I, and, and I'll give you the biggest example. I can give you the biggest example. We had a blockage in one of the Freon cooling loops on Discovery. And we tore Discovery apart looking for that blockage and pulled pipes out. And at the end of the day, we didn't find anything. But we replaced all the pipes. We replaced all the filters. We looked at the pumps. And it's been working great for months. And it works. So what do you do? You say we've got two of those loops. You know, the pumps have redundant power. We're going to go fly. Uh, I'm going to add, we have a, a standard process during ground processing that looks at unexplained anomalies. Frequently, there are test setup errors or, or even bump switches by operators in the cockpit. Um, and, and in order to close a, an unexplained anomaly here at Kennedy Space Center, it takes a review by the chief engineers of both NASA and United Space Alliance, and they, they identify the most probable cause, and they also look at the risks if it, if it recurs, and we elevate those that represent risk to the program. So, so there are probably a, a dozen unexplained anomalies on the flow of the length of the one we just went through or more. Um, and we brief those routinely to the program at program briefs. They're not all elevated to the, to the public's eye, but, but they are not secret either. Um, so yes, we do have more than one or two unexplained anomalies per flow. And, uh, and we take a close look at each and every one and go through the process to the best of our ability. But in a testing environment like the OPF, the most probable causes are frequently um, in the electronic boxes that were not booted up properly. You probably had that problem in your home computer or in accidental uh, test switches or valves out of position. And, and that's frequently the way we close a lot of them. Thank you. Irene? Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. I have two questions for um, Bill and for Wayne. The first one has to do with the uh, possible um, changes or the discussion about changing the LCC from four, four to three or four sensors. And for that, I would like to know what the role of the ITA is in that and if that is actually your call, whether to make that change or is this going to be something that this new organization is, is involved in or will actually come down and say, no, we don't think that's a good idea, period. And then the second question has to do with the tanking test slash launch attempt. And I'm having trouble even thinking of a scenario that would um, turn a tanking test into a launch. Like, what is it that you would be doing? I mean, it sounds like you're just saying, well, we're going to go ahead and launch, but don't get your hopes up. <laughs> you know, what is it that, what's the distinction between, between what you're trying to do there? I'm, I'm going to try to. I'll try to answer it, and then Wayne's going to back me up here and, and come in. And I think you and Mike Whitmore may have. We have a working group that does launch commit criteria. We have a very specific technical body that if you want to make a change to the launch commit criteria, you have to go through this launch commit criteria working group. The technical folks have to work their way through it and approve it. And, and then again, I think it's approved at the, at the chief engineer level and, and, the, and the board level, the chairman of the board and the board members all have to sign up to it. So there's a very specific discipline technical way that we go make uh, launch commit criteria changes. And it wouldn't be that we just want to go do that or we just came up and said this would be a great idea. What we do is we say, look, we'd like for you to go look at this and see if this makes technical sense and make sure that this is safe and the right thing to go do. And that we meet all the requirements within the shuttle program that we set for ourselves for redundancy and, uh, and, and safety. They'll go through, assess it. If they, if if we've met all those requirements and we can show that and they feel comfortable with that, then we'll make a change to the launch commit criteria. Otherwise, it'll stay 4-4. So there's a very specific process we go through for that. As far as the tanking test versus a launch, I mean, what we're doing right now is we're preserving the opportunity that if we found something and, and the troubleshooting that's ongoing today, if something jumped out and we said, there's the problem, then that tanking test actually would be the launch countdown, and we would go on the 26th, as, as Wayne stated. What we're, what we're saying, though, is if we haven't found anything by then, and this technical community comes back and says, look, 
we need to make a few changes or we want to put a, uh, an instrumentation in the orbiter and we think we need to do a tanking test, then the 26 becomes that tanking test. And what we're doing is we're preserving schedule. We're trying to do, uh, trying to keep this on schedule as much as we can right now and preserve our options to the last, you know, to the last opportunity. The tanking test that we would do would, would be in a countdown configuration. So it would be that kind of configuration. We have those procedures. We understand that process. If we had to make modifications to that procedure or, or things like that, then we might have to do some safety uh, review of that and tabletop. And it may not very well be on the 26. It may have to go at a, at a later time. But what we're doing today is just opening up those possibilities to where we can keep those options open for as long as we can. Um, it may be that we get to, to Friday of this week and those options aren't available to us and one would have to change where we're headed right now. But, uh, but, but that's where we're going. And Wayne, do you, Ed, Mike, do I have anything to add to that? No, I, I guess I would add that, that the ITA, the Independent Technical Authority, is a part of all the our program requirements control board reviews, including the LCCs that are approved at, at the right. PRC. So they're, they're involved in the process. You've got time for one more. Seth, no? Thank you for the New York Times. Uh, Mr. Hale, you talked about uh, replacing the Freon loops, et cetera, on Endeavor. I was wondering, have you started uh, thinking or have you started uh, replacing cables and harnesses uh, uh, between the Discovery and the tank? And I'll follow up. I'd, I'd like Ed. You can describe the wires that we have removed in more detail than I can. Um, let's see, I'm trying to understand your question from a from a discovery standpoint uh, on the wires, uh, this particular time we have not replaced any wires that are associated with eco sensor number two. Uh, we have uh, done, as I explained earlier, uh, checked out uh, all those wires in the orbiter um, through resistance and continuity checks. Uh, we also have uh, simulated our tanking uh, through those wires, again, without actually having cryos on board the tank. And all that has come out good, but we have not actually replaced the wires in the orbiter at this moment. Did you make some changes after one of the tanking tests? The first tanking test. Yeah, after right between the first tanking test and the second tanking test, we added a number of instrumentation spots uh, in order to go grab uh, much more data than we have ever seen um, on those sensors. And that was to get current and voltage readings uh, across all the eco sensors. We grabbed that data during uh, tanking test number two and. Uh, and we are using that data now to help uh, make sure we understand how the system works uh, because we had so much data during uh, that tanking test too. We then brought all that back to flight configuration, which is where we are at for launch countdown and which is where we're still at from a flight uh, harness standpoint. Um, so all that instrumentation has been pulled out and we're back in flight configuration for our launch attempt that we did and we have not put new instrumentation in except to check out these sensors and these systems part of troubleshooting. Ed, did you change some wires on? Didn't we pull some new wires for uh, eco sensor three and four inside the orbiter after? After uh, tanking yeah. test uh, one, when we had the anomaly, uh, we did go and replace all the wires associated with ECOS uh, number three and ECOS number four, which was the events that occurred during tanking test one. All that wire has been replaced in the orbiter uh, at the umbilical, and of course now we're flying on a different tank, so that's even got different wire if you want to look at it from a wiring standpoint. Uh, so for ECOS 3 and 4, all that is new wire. Uh, for ECO 2, which is what our anomaly is this time, uh, we have done everything we can do to make sure that the wire is good. Uh, when we had the first anomaly, we had quite a, we looked at it and said uh, our normal pattern would be to go replace all that wire. So before we did all these checks that we're doing now, we said, let's go replace all the wire. And that's our approach at that point was we replace the wire and then go back into tank and test. This time we are trying to confirm all that wire is good. If we find any problems, obviously we're going to replace that wire. Are there any uh, things that you tried and really turned out to be just uh, that didn't work, period, that you would uh, just uh, discard as uh, tests in the future? Uh, no, in fact, uh, just the opposite. We're coming up with uh, new ways to go look at our wires within the orbiter should we have other orbiting orbiter problems. Also, the way we've checked out our point sensor box in the vehicle is the most extensive 
check out we've ever done in a vehicle. And because of that, and because of some of the other analysis that we've been doing, uh, we are going to probably change some of the ways that we check out this point sensor box when it's in a standalone load before it gets integrated into the vehicle. So instead of saying that we have, uh, we are just the opposite. We are finding new ways to do things in ways that will be even better than what we've done over the last 30 years. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. We'll keep you informed about when the next mission management team briefing is going to be. And thank you very much. Beispiel James Duhan, alias Sport Engineer Scotty, ist gestorben. Duhan starb im Alter von 85 Jahren an einer Lungenentzündung. Er litt seit längerem an Alzheimer und hatte sich bereits im vergangenen Jahr von seinem Publikum verabschiedet. Die Fernsehserie Raumschiff Enterprise aus den 60er und 70er Jahren brachte ihm Weltruhm ein. Good evening and welcome to our post-mission management team meeting press conference. have uh, participants for our press conference this evening, Bill Parsons, Space Shuttle Program Manager, John Murator, the Manager, Space Shuttle Systems Engineering and Integration, and Mike Webmore, Director, Shuttle Processing here at Kennedy Space Center. And we'll begin with opening statements from each of these and we'll follow that with your questions. Bill. Well, good evening. Uh, we just uh, finished about 15, 20 minutes ago with our mission management team meeting. Uh, what I will lay out for you is the plan that we arrived to in that meeting. Uh, unfortunately, Wayne's back in, Wayne Hale would be here with you. He's back in Houston, and uh, so he had some things he needed to take care of, but I'm sure he'll be back here with us here pretty, pretty soon. Uh, the decisions we made today were to continue with our troubleshooting tonight that we had laid out in front of us, and that will go on through the, through the evening and, and into uh, the first part of tomorrow. Um, we have some very specific things that we're going to go, go perform, and it will help us com completely close this, this issue out. And then once that's completed, once all that troubleshooting is completed, and, and, and John will tell you a little bit more about that, then what we plan to do is we have some uh, repairs to some things we found already, some ground issues that we're going to go make those repairs immediately uh, upon the vehicle. And then we have a, a pin swap that we're going to do for the point sensor box, taking eco sensor two to uh, to the eco sensor four card within the point sensor box, and that'll continue to help us isolate this problem during uh, during uh, subsequent operations. At that point, we will uh, have a pretest briefing for a launch countdown on Friday afternoon, and then uh, we will pick up the count for a launch on Saturday uh, around noon, I think it is. And we will proceed to a, a launch time of about 10:34, I believe, on Tuesday uh, Tuesday morning. And I believe that's the 26th, correct? So uh, currently, uh, we've laid this plan out. We have some th a, a, a great amount of work to, in front of us to get us through this and get us ready for this. But uh, we've all agreed that this work is uh, is doable, and that it all takes us to a uh, to a launch on the uh, 26th. Uh, Mike can tell you a little bit more about it, our, our scrub turnaround scenarios that we have in case of weather and things like that. Um, but uh, right now, we will launch at 1034 on, uh, on Tuesday morning. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, John? Yeah, I just want to say this has been a very, very thorough effort that we've been through. Uh, we've used every kind of analysis technique and test technique we can find. In the end, uh, analysis of the circuitry suggested that a grounding might be a problem. Testing of the box in the uh, EMI facility at Houston suggested that electromagnetic interference could interfere with the box. We went looking in the vehicle and we found a discrepancy in the grounding of the vehicle. We're going to go in tonight and we're going to try to replicate as best we can the electromagnetic environment at launch to try to see if we can trap the signature of it. If, even if we can't trap the signature, we're going to go make uh, the system good, bring it back into its proper specification. And then the best way to go and further understand the problem is to go into a cryogenic operation, uh, load the tank up, and observe its operations. And that's best accomplished in the environment of a launch countdown. Okay, John, thank you very much. And Mike? Um, we've been in support of this operation, it, it seems like, for the last month, but it's been for the last week while we troubleshot this sensor. Uh, we'll complete that troubleshooting overnight. 
and then get ready to support a call to stations for our launch countdown process. That call to stations will be about midday on on uh, Friday, um, for excuse me, midday Saturday. I got to count days here for a, a T zero as as uh, Bill said um, on Tuesday morning. Uh, the the final details of the schedule are probably being flowed out as we speak since this decision is is less than an hour old. But I have approximate schedules if anybody has questions in that direction. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll take your questions. I would appreciate your uh, name and affiliation, and wait for the mic, please. Um, Jay? <coughs> Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, Bill, you say 10.34 a.m. Is that the opening of the window aiming for a 10.39 launch? You know, I may not have the times exactly. i gotta, I got to have the, the, the folks uh, give me those times, but I believe it is. I believe that's the opening of the window. And then we're probably shooting for whatever that mid part of that window is, uh, the five minute uh, the window, yeah. Marcia? Marcia, then Associated Press. Sounds like you've rolled out a tanking test then. And, and, and also, how sure are you that this grounding is what caused the sensor failure? We have the most prob probable causes that we've listed out in a fault tree analysis. We're, we have work to do to close that fault tree analysis out. It's all part of this troubleshooting plan. We will go and close out all the common causes that we think this could be by doing the rest of this troubleshooting that we're going to go do, as, as John stated earlier. When we get to that point, then we've done everything we can. And that's that's kind of where we're going to get to. We've done everything we can, and, and, and we've eliminated the most probable cause. The best thing that we can do then is then to go in, and, and we have all the LCCs and all the safety nets that we have in front of us, and, and we believe the best way to go through this is to do a countdown. If the sensors work exactly like we, we think they will, then we'll launch on that day. If anything goes... Uh, not per the plan that we've laid out in front of us, uh, then we'll have a scrub and we'll have to talk about it and uh, and either we can fix that and, and do a quick turnaround or, or we may have other issues on our on our plate. But but right now we think we have eliminated all all the common causes that we believe to do this and we've done everything we possibly could on the vehicle. Dan? Uh, Dan Billow with Channel 2. Uh, Mr. Parsons, you say if the sensors work the way you expect them to, uh, you launch. How do you expect them to work? Do you expect to have four or three? And what does the pin swap do for you? Well, this, the pin swap helps us eliminate. And I'm, I'm probably let me tell you. I'm going to tell you what we expect to have, and I'm going to let John explain some of the technical details of, of how the, the box works. Um, we expect to have four four sensors. We we have talked in great detail about our rationale for flying with three or four sensors. Uh, we are not complete with that, but in fact, if we knew, if we had a, a failure of a sensor and we could understand that failure and it was a known failure that we that we expected based on the pin swap that, that John will talk about, then we we might very well be willing to go fly with three or four sensors. There's good flight rationale behind that. But uh, if in fact something happened and, and it wasn't expected. Well, then I think that would be uh, we'd have to stop and, and go back and reassess that, and, and 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 it may take us more than 24 hours, but it but it could cause us a scrub out of the out of the whole month of July. I just I just don't know that yet. And John, why don't you explain a little bit more about the pin swap and, and what that tells us? Okay, um, it would be very nice if this is the kind of problem where we go and we make a measurement, and when we make the measurement, we go, aha, that's it. Um, we have worked our way through the system, starting with the sensor in the tank all the way back to the computers on the ground. And we've worked methodically to eliminate each part of that. Uh, on the fault tree, there are some 300 blocks, and about 150 of them are bottom line root causes that could be the problem. Um, as we worked our way through that, uh, we tried to recreate the environment in the ship to be as close as possible to tanking. And if you were the point sensor box, for example, you'd think you'd gone through 10 tankings because we made the thermal environment around side the box, inside the box, the current flow through the box, the signals it saw on the outside of the box. We made it all look like tanking, and we did it again and again and again and again. And we did it first with a very limited set of things that we were affecting, and then we expanded our circle of things we were making more and more like tanking. The more we did that, uh, the more and we did that in parallel with analyzing the circuits. And as we're analyzing the circuits, the, the uh, circuit analysis team said, you know, this could be a difference in grounding because this box is redundant. It has four different power supplies that come into it for redundancy. 
And if, if the ground potential between them is a little different, it could fake the circuit out into giving us a false wet indication, which is what we're seeing. So we sent the teams into the orbiter to go find out what the, what the cause was, uh, to see if there was a grounding problem. At the same time, we were testing the box, and we saw a false wet indication in the electromagnetic uh, interference testing that we were seeing in Houston. So that really gave us a pause to think that this is a system-wide, a system-level effect. However, the concern is still resident that, well, what if it's a specific component in the system? What if it's the sensor? What if it's the wiring? What if it's the point sensor box? And the best way to determine if that's the case is to mix the components so that uh, we don't get the same. If the failure is in one component, we'll get a different indication than we got last time. And so what we're going to do is basically uh, we're going to uh, hook uh, sensor 4 up to, up to the electronics for sensor 2 and vice versa. That way, if the problem is with the sensor or the associated wiring, it's going to show up now as a sensor 4 problem. If the problem is in the point sensor box, it's going to show up as a sensor 2 problem. That will enable us at least to, to determine which side of the system it is. Now, that assumes that the problem recurs exactly the way that uh, we have seen it happen before. Uh, but we think that will give us an important insight into seeing how, uh, if this problem does reoccur, as to what the potential cause is. So, so the scenarios would be all four sensors work and you're good to go. Um, sensor four shows a failure. We would discuss in great detail what that exactly means. But, but in, in our minds, we will have already done that ahead of time, which we're doing right now. And that would, say, and that would say there's a strong possibility we understand this completely and, and we're good to go because it's a wire problem, an open in a wire, and we, we still have three of, of, the, of the sensors that are good. But if it came back, it was a sensor two problem, I think everybody would have to say, wait a minute, we, whatever we've done it hasn't really solved our issues, and we really need to step back and take another hard look at this. And so what we've done is we've given ourselves another safety net, another way to take a look at this and make sure we really do uh, understand the system and that, we, that it is operating exactly like we think it should operate. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Stephen Young with SpaceFlightNow.com. What are you actually going to do during the countdown to check out the sensors? Anything more than you did last week? And will you have the re a revised uh, LCC in place if you uh, want to go with just three of those four sensors? Let's see. I, I'm, I'm going to let. Yeah, I'll let you explain what we're going to do, and then maybe you can talk about the LCC. Okay. But let's talk about. Um, we're going to finalize the plan on Friday morning. We've got the engineering teams right now focused on troubleshooting in the ship, trying to understand if, if the grounding problem we've had with the, trying to recreate the, the launch environment, we can track the signature of this problem. That's where we got the teams focused tonight and through tomorrow. After that, we're going to sit down and we're going to look how we can most effectively monitor during the countdown. And there are some good ideas floating around about how we can effectively monitor in, in the countdown. Uh, but at minimum, it's going to involve some combination of every time we change something on the spacecraft that we think uh, could potentially cause the sensors to change state, we're going to go check the sensors again. And there's a way to set us up for continuous monitoring, and there's a way to do specific test checkouts at, at different times. And we haven't done the exact trades as to how we're going to go do that. But either way, what we're going to do is basically get ourselves in a position that every time we change something on the spacecraft that we might have some suspicion could affect the sensor, we're going to go check the sensor again. And we have to do that by some sort of explicit mechanism because the sensor is going to be reading wet because it's in the tank and it's in the bottom of the tank and the tank's going to be filled with hydrogen. So there's an electronic way to check it. There's a couple of different modes to do it in. We're going to run through that whole technical debate, make sure we got the right plan. We'll do that Friday morning, and the procedures will be long in place before we get to Tuesday morning. And I guess we will not change the LCC at this particular time. What we're going to do is keep the LCC just like it is, but we're going to lay out the logic that says if, if we get a signature that we understand, again, if we understand, then we would take an exception and, and, and fly with three or four. Uh, again, not expecting that. We, we should see four or four, but just in, you know, we'll do the forward work to say if we see a signature, we understand. And we've taken exception in five with three or four. Okay, thanks. Irene? Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, I'd like to know if this explanation also satisfies you to the problems that were found on the earlier sensor tests and also 
How difficult was it for the team to arrive at this conclusion? Well, I think, again, the fault tree leads us down to the most probable cause. We're following the fault tree all the way down. And so I think it would, it would encompass um, the first um, um, tanking test, although, you know, with a different tank and, a, and different wiring and all the things we've done, I mean, I can't sit there and say that there's not something that's different about each one of the tanking tests because we've had different components and different, uh, and different kinds of situations when we've done this tanking test. But, again, by closing out the fault tree, we, we believe we will have encompassed the, the issues that we had on the first tanking test. And then what was the second part of the question? How controversial it was? How was your mom even about how, how difficult was it for you all to reach a consensus? Well, there's been meetings going on probably since about 8 o'clock this morning with the, with the technical community, and then John had his troubleshooting team together at 12.30, and then we got the MMP together. It was just an awful lot of information to go over. And I think that, that the reason it was long is because it was just a, a great deal of information that we had to cover in that period of time. I wouldn't say it was extremely, um, there was not a, a great deal of debate. There, are, There's the engineering community that wants to make sure that we've, we've got this covered. There's the, uh, the, uh, the mission operations director that has some issues that they wanted to talk about. And, and all we needed to do was get everything out there in front of us, discuss it, and make sure everybody was comfortable with it. In the end, we're all comfortable with our forward plan. In, in addition to the fact that we have many safety nets with the LCCs and all the different things that we're going to do to ensure that we we uh, don't proceed unless we feel like uh, we're safe to go fly. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark Carruth from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, a little help on the location of the problems, please. Uh, the source of the EMI, where the ground issue was, and where this pin problem or pin connector site is. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the pin swap right at the point sensor box. So that way, we'll be able to say that all that the problem is either in the electronics or in wiring from the box all the way through the tank sensor. With regard to where the grounding was uh, determined not to be completely per specification, that is located in the aft fuselage of the orbiter in near Avionics Bay 5, which is uh, in the aft fuselage. With regard to the source of the EMI, don't know yet. That's why we're going to test tonight. We're going to be testing equipment in the orbiter. We're going to be dry spinning the uh, LH2 recirculation pumps. We're going to be cycling um, heaters on the APUs. We're going to be uh, also uh, cycling the bipod heaters and the feed line heaters on the external tank. And so uh, we have uh, eight different things we're going to be cycling. We're going to be cycling the cameras in the um, ET umbilical well that are part of the orbiter that, uh, that are used to photograph the tank after separation. Basically, we took a screen that said, what's changed since the last time we flew and what things could generate the type of signal that we use to recreate the circuit hang-up in the electromagnetic interference test at Johnson Space Center. So that was the kind of screen we used. And then we looked at also at when the sensor uh, went back into normal operation during tanking test one and during the launch countdown, what other things were going around? What other things were happening at that time? So things made it onto the suspect list if either they were in the area they, uh, they, they had a, a signal that looked like it would be of the right type and if they were new to the area. And that's, that's uh, how we picked those things. And we'll run the test tonight and if we find it, we'll be happy, I'm sure, to talk about how we found it. If we don't find it, that doesn't mean necessarily it's not there because we can't electrically create exactly the same environment that we have except in a launch countdown. We can't do that because the system has heaters all over it that are thermostatically controlled it has uh, functions that we just can't activate safely while the rotating service structure is up and the orbiter weather protection is around the orbiter. So we just can't activate all that equipment. So to really get there, we have to get into a launch mode, and that's what we'll do, we'll do Tuesday. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, with CBS, um, a real quick procedural question for Bill. If, if you get down and count and decide you do need to go with three or four, is, just procedurally, is that a waiver process, or do you have the three or four already in the can that you just invoke it? I just procedurally and then I have a call. We're going to do all the work to do it. To, to do a LCC change is, is a, as I said before, it's a, a great deal of work. And what we're going to do is we're going to do all that work ahead of time. But again, since we we think we're going to see 404, uh, we're not going to go make the change to the LCC at this particular time. But what we have talked about is it's called an exception, I believe. And you would take an exception with it. Again, the MMT has to approve of that. 
it, it would have been well thought out of ahead of time, and it has to have a certain signature before we would ever agree to that. So it, it, we will have laid out the scenarios. It will come back to the MMT and dis be discussed, and then they'll they'll take an exception and then go with three or four if if it meets all the criteria. Thanks. And then one for John. Um, I know you don't want to focus on any one particular area because you're obviously going to go look at everything. But I did hear some talk that you know these ecosensor anomalies occurred pretty much simultaneously or pretty close to when the bipod heater and the heaters turned on and off uh, during count. If you get into a situation and it turns out that you think that is the scenario, um, I know you turn the heaters off before launch, but also know there's some relaxed time in those sensors when they fail wet before they go back to dry. Can you just tell me how that works um, if you've got a launch count and you, and you thought that was the problem, uh, how turning the heaters off affects that and, and all of that kind of thing? Okay. We're getting really down. One of the things we did was a detailed timeline analysis where we looked at everything that happened and what else was going on at the same time. What we found was in tanking test one, I think there were 15 seconds between the time we turned off the, uh, the bipod heaters and the sensors started working properly. And that in uh, the, the launch countdown, I think there were 15 minutes between when, uh, when we uh, turned off the, the bipod heaters and the sensors started activating properly. Uh, right now, if we go into the countdown and we go ahead and we, uh, and we get another wet sensor, we're going to find the right place to turn the bipod heaters off and then we're going to try to see if we can, if that doesn't restore the uh, sensors to functionality. Uh, if it does, then I think we'll wind up turning the heaters back on because we want to protect the bipod from ice formation, and we'll wait down to T minus nine, and we'll turn the heaters off then, and then go test those sensors then. And if we meet our launch commit criteria, uh, three or four, or four or four, depending on how we work out the pre-planned contingency, then we'll be ready to go because we know the source of what's creating the problems is off for flight. And that's the way we'll go. Sorry. So, uh, Todd Malik with Space.com and Space News. Um, I have a question for Bill. If there is something that you find uh, tomorrow or Friday that does that does so, you have to stand back and take a look at it. Does, how does that affect plans that go into the launch countdown on Saturday? Could you work through the weekend with the countdown going, or or would you have to kind of stop plans as they are? Well, man, and I'll let uh, John help me a little bit. But if, if we find an EMI source and we met, and we're able to track it, it means that there's a ground within that EMI source that's being produced that's not 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 uh, well grounded. So we'll we'll go off and troubleshoot that, and we'll try to make it right. And that's the first thing we'll do. And so uh, again, if if in fact we need a little more time, we'll just change our plan and take a little more time. If in fact uh, we can do that pretty quickly and get a, a good reading, we would proceed ahead. I, I think what we're going to have to do is just kind of deal with it real time. Uh, and see exactly uh, what it is that we find and what we can do to uh, resolve it. And then if it fits in the timeline, we'll, uh, we'll continue with the count. If we need some extra time, we'll uh, slip for 24 hours and, and, and try again. Uh, or however how much time it takes to go fix the problem. So, John, is that pretty much how, how that will work? Uh, yeah, I, I, let me actually take that one. I, um, we need to get out of the aft. Um, in order to do aft closeouts and make sure the vehicle is ready to go into countdown. Now, we have carried those aft closeouts into the countdown process in the past if we were working in anomaly. But about 20 hours into the countdown is when you do uh, the cryogenic loading for the fuel cell uh, power reactant storage distribution system. So we would ha absolutely have to be out of there by then. So it, if we have some troubleshooting to do, we're going we're gonna to generate an estimate on schedule. If we can get it done and still get it out of aft closeout, we could probably continue and let a little bit of overlap between those processes take place. But it, it is limited by the hazardous operations during the countdown procedure, and you really can't um, you can't slip much more than 24 hours uh, from the current schedule with some of these minor troubleshooting things and still make the the countdown timeline. If we did that, we'd simply go into a hold. There is a scheduled hold uh, before you do um, PRSD loads. We could also stop before we got into the preparations if we were doing troubleshooting and then pick back up on the countdown as soon as we were, were done and, and out of the aft and the aft was closed out. So so we'll handle that real time. Uh, we've done that in the past when anomalies came up. John Kelly with Florida Today, I think, for Mr. Murator. Uh, on the grounding, just to make sure that I understand, when you said it wasn't the spec, maybe I oversimplified, does that mean there was something that wasn't grounded before that you need to ground? Or Okay, here we go. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Well, let me kind of kind of describe how, how this goes. All the electronic equipment on the orbiter that you all the equipment that uses electrical power, not just electronics, but anything that uses electrical power, a motor or something like that, 
has a ground that comes back to what we call the single point ground for that system. And if it's on main bus A, there's a ground for main bus A. There's a ground for main bus B. That ground is tied to the vehicle structure, the, the metal of the structure. The amount that this, and a unit of resistance is normally an ohm, okay, one ohm. And, and you see in the electronics you have things like resistors that are 1,000 ohms, 300 ohms, even maybe sometimes a million ohms, okay? We are talking in fractions of a million, okay? Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but it matters from the point of view of the box because what happens is, is that if the box has got these different channels of electronics are running through it, and it's got uh, power and grounding for each of those separately, and if they start to get off a little bit different from each other, uh, that's when the circuits can get tripped up. And so a very small amount of resistance can cause, a, uh, cause those grounds to flip up and down. And in particular, that can happen when you get a large electrical transient. And the transients that we showed the box is susceptible to in, in the lab at, uh, uh, at Houston was one uh, uh, one ten millionth of a second. Okay, so, you know, th I hope that those statistics kind of give you a kind of scale. This is in the case of we're wandering around seeing what's not plugged in. I mean, it isn't that kind of thing. It's where you go look at it and you'd say, hey, that looks like a good bond. If you didn't use a very, very careful precision meter, it would read as a perfect uh, structural ground. It's when we, but however, in these very complex electrical systems, you can get into that kind of problem. And so that's, that's the kind of window we're looking for. We're looking for a, a bond that is, that is uh, a very, very small res extra resistance than the other returns do. And then when we get a very high voltage, high speed electrical transient, that that could then lift the return enough to cause the circuits to malfunction and latch up in the wrong state. That's the kind of scenario we're talking about. Okay, Bill? Uh, just two quick ones for me, just to kind of close this out for Mike. Um, assuming a launch on the 26th, or at least you get that far, what is your scrub turnaround scenario through the end of the, the storm, the normal window through the 31st? How many attempts do you have? And then maybe for Bill, um, where does it stand now on extending the window? Well, what, what was proposed today, and we'll put to, together the detailed procedure on this, was that we'd, we'd have a launch attempt on the 26th and then the 27th. And then during a 48-hour scrub turnaround, we'd, we'd probably reload one of the two um, commodities, either hydrogen or oxygen, for the fuel cells. And we could try again on the 29th and then load the second commodity and, and make our fourth try on the 31st. Uh, recognize at this point we've only requested the, the range for the 26th and 27th, and there is a, a delta behind us um, on the range that's actually going to have to move in order to free up the 27th. And, and we're working that through channels now. So. Um, those would be the four attempts uh, that we've laid out right now. And I think we'd work our way through that. And if we if we ended up having to use the uh, the August time frame, if we felt, thought we could still go and make a launch, uh, we definitely have August the first. We we've, we've looked at that, and, and I've gotten feedback that that one we lose very little lighting, and we can we can get the pictures we want. It gets progressively worse from there. And at some point, there's a cutoff. Well, August fifth is out of the question. So we've told you August first through August fourth. We probably, you know, have to sit here and say, okay, do we get another attempt on, on the first, based on whatever the scenario we came into the launch scrub turnaround, and then could we get another one on the second, and then if you if you didn't get the first one until the second, would you be willing to to skip the third and take the fourth and things like that? So I, I would just say it's still open for August first through fourth. Uh, it just deteriorates as we go out through that that uh, those days, and uh, we would prefer it to be closer to August first or August second. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Just a point of clarification, I'm hearing that our uh, preferred launch time on the uh, 26th is 10.39 a.m. Eastern Time. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.
IMF is here. This is shuttle ground operations at the Kennedy Space Center, where the first wave of the STS-14 astronauts have uh, just landed, and uh, they are taxiing into the ramp. They are coming in two waves, Commander Eileen Collins and Mission Specialist 4 Wendy Lawrence, and Pilot Jim Kelly and Mission Specialist 5 Charlie Camarda are in this wave. And then coming in the second wave will be Mission Specialist 2, Steve Robinson, Mission Specialist 1, Suichi Noguchi, and Mission Specialist 3, Andy Thomas. The aircraft uh, being greeted by the news media, and it is anticipated that uh, at least after the second wave arrives that Commander Collins and the flight crew will come over and have a few words. Second wave is about a half an hour behind the first two aircraft. The astronauts have been out in Houston at the Johnson Space Center for some additional runs in the mission simulator. This allows them to uh, keep their skills sharp for the upcoming 12-day flight. And they are now back in preparation for picking up the countdown, which begins at noon on Saturday leading to a launch on Tuesday, the 26th of July, 10.39 Eastern Time. Weather at the Kennedy Space Center today, warm and humid, no showers in the immediate area.
Tomorrow is the day when the astronauts will begin in earnest their countdown activities leading up to the launch. Today is uh, not uh, structured to a great extent, but uh, they will have some activities tomorrow associated with uh, briefings on the status of the countdown and discovery, the testing that's been going on, and also the uh, payloads. Jim Kelly and Charlie Camarda arriving in T-38-914, and this is uh, Commander Eileen Collins and Mission Specialist for Wendy Lawrence in T-38-917. And there is our Kennedy Space Center Director, Jim Kennedy, greeting the crew. And the uh, Chief of the Astronaut Office, Jerry Ross. And Commander Collins will be making approaches to the shuttle to the uh, shuttle landing facility in the uh, shuttle training aircraft, as will pilot uh, Jim Kelly. And uh, that uh, activity will start uh, tomorrow morning and continue on into uh, Sunday as well. Again, our KSC director. Chief of the astronaut uh, office, astronaut uh, Jerry Ross, and the crew is. Uh, going to be going to the um, Landing Aids Control Building, which will allow them to uh, get a status on uh, where the uh, other crew members are in their en route uh, flight to KSC, and it will get them out of the rather intense heat and humidity here at the Cape today. The crew will actually have dinner after they get in. They'll. Uh, have something to eat about 12.30 or soon after they get to the crew quarters. There's uh, the first of the T-38s touching down. And touchdown. Two more to follow. Crew will go to bed tonight about 4 p.m. And of course, these uh, times are all synced to their mission times on the International Space Station. And then they'll be awakened at uh, midnight. As we mentioned, Atlantis was towed over to the Vehicle Assembly Building transfer aisle this morning from its hangar. And it uh, is awaiting its uh, schedule for planned stacking mating to the external tank and solid rocket boosters.
usually pop the canopies uh, very shortly after they touch down and begin to taxi in because uh, the inside of the T-38s can get very hot once they're on the ground, on the sun. Now the next aircraft is uh, on short final right now. And the third one over Orlando. And that is Steve Robinson, mission specialist number two. So that means uh, he's being followed by Suichi Noguchi in the second aircraft. And uh, also Andy Thomas in an approaching T-38. And uh, Jerry Ross, Chief of the Vehicle Integrated Test Team Office here at the Kennedy Space Center. And that is Suichi Noguchi, 
Mission Specialist Number One from JAXA. In our next aircraft with Missing Specialist 3, Andy Thomas, is about 20 miles out. Touchdown. Last of the crew members touching down at 12.15 Eastern Time. And we can see the D-38 taxiing in past the control tower. And we're anticipating that the crew will come over and have a brief statement. With Andy Thomas on the ground, all of seven of our STS-114 crew members are back at KSC. Again, with our center director, Jim Kennedy. And there's Commander Eileen Collins. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Well, we think it's a beautiful day in Florida today. It looks like a nice day for a space shuttle launch. <laughs> so we're hoping that this weather holds through through all of next week or whatever day we launch. I hope we get this nice dry weather. And with an early morning launch, we hope we get a give you good show and get a good launch off. I wanted to let you know uh, some of the things that we've been doing for the past week and a half. We have uh, opportunities down here to train 
And as, of course, you know, we've been focusing on the on-orbit part of the mission for us, so we've been uh, doing training on robotics and rendezvous. We have the ability to do that here. We've also been flying the shuttle training aircraft and the T-38s. And uh, with the launch delay, our end of mission landing is going to be before sunrise. So we were hoping that you'd be able to see the landing, but it won't be quite as visible now. I we'll think the landing will be sometime around 5.30, uh, plus or minus maybe 30 minutes, uh, 13 days after we launch. And we'll be able to get an exact time on that. It kind of depends on the space station and, and where it is, and that might change during our mission. So about 5.30 or so, so we'll be out here training for some night landings in the shuttle training aircraft. And we've also been keeping track of the uh, events that have been taking place in the uh, development for the plans to uh, test and analyze what happened to Echo Sensor 2 a week and a half ago during the launch countdown. And uh, my crew has been listening to the technical meetings and to the management meetings, and that's been very important for us to do that and to really uh, understand the problem. It's very important for us to say that we are very proud of the work that the engineers and the managers and the technicians have done over the past week and a half trying to find out what's going on with this uh, very elusive problem. And we have a lot of confidence in what they're doing, and we think they have a great plan that they're going forward with. Um, we hope that we're able to launch on Tuesday, but you know, regardless of when we launch, you know, the launch date to us isn't that important. Um, the launch, the, what's important to us is that you know, we uh, get through this process and that we do it right. We have, like I said, a fantastic team of people working on this. They've been putting in very, very long hours, and they've been really working hard. They're very dedicated people, uh, very dedicated to the space program and getting the shuttle flying again. And we're very, again, very, very proud of the work they're doing, and that really comes from the bottom of our hearts. So thanks to all of you out there that are uh, working away at getting the shuttle Discovery ready to fly. And uh, having said that, we're really excited about getting this launch off. We're uh, very prepared, and uh, we'll be talking to you from space. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Who now will head to the astronaut quarters. Good morning, everyone. This is our launch minus three day countdown status briefing for the second launch attempt of STS-114 and Space Shuttle Discovery. Here to bring us the status this morning is Pete Nikolenko, NASA test director. Good morning. And Kathy Winters, the shuttle weather officer from the Department of the Air Force. Good morning. And we'll begin first with Pete Nikolenko. Pete. Thanks, George. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be back here again today to provide STS-114 countdown status for the return to flight mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station. Discovery is in excellent shape as we complete the troubleshooting from the liquid hydrogen engine cutoff sensor anomaly which caused our first launch attempt scrub on July 13th. The past week or so have been quite busy for our teams as we've conducted extensive troubleshooting and analysis to the problem condition. Yesterday, we completed ground wire repairs and the eco-sensor connector pin swaps inside the orbiter aft compartment. Retests were complete and good. This work in the orbiter aft compartment is now complete, and we're currently in the process to again close the aft compartment out uh, for flight. Systems confidence checks will pick up shortly. The flight crew arrived back at KSC yesterday, and I know they're excited and ready for the mission. At this point, we're tracking no significant issues, and our remaining preparations to begin the countdown are essentially complete. The significant events for the next few days include launch countdown call to stations at 11.30 a.m. today, and the countdown clock will begin counting at noon local. I will load the onboard fuel cell reactants tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and proceed with checkout of the orbiter and ground communications network Monday morning. The rotating service structure retraction is scheduled for 1.30 p.m. Monday afternoon, and we plan to pick up with the external tank loading 
operation at 12.30 or 12.40 a.m., excuse me, Tuesday morning. The launch window, again, is 10 minutes in duration and will open at 10.34 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Again, during the T-9 minute hold, we'll synchronize to the actual T-0 time based on the day of launch parameters. And again, we typically will target the middle of the launch window, which corresponds to the 10.39 a.m. time frame. This is a 12-day mission with uh, no planned mission extension days except for weather. The end of mission landing is scheduled for here at Kennedy Space Center at approximately 5.46 a.m. on the morning of August 7th. We do have a standard 24 and 48 hour scrub turnaround capability, which means we can perform four launch attempts prior to standing down for the end of this launch period. Bottom line is that we believe our flight systems and ground support hardware are ready. We know that our flight crew and our support teams are ready, and we're all eagerly anticipating and looking forward to a successful launch and mission. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And now to the launch weather with Kathy Winters, the shuttle weather officer. Kathy. Well, good morning. We've been watching a tropical storm, Franklin, for the last several days due to the fact that it is off the east coast of Florida. The Hurricane Center is forecasting for the storm to move off to the northeast as the trough digs into the eastern portion of the United States. And so the storm is going to track gradually towards the east. It's going to experience some shear, so it's going to be a questionable whether the storm will survive over the next 48 hours, but then it should gradually track off towards uh, Bermuda over the next couple of days. So uh, for our area right now, our concern has gone down the last uh, 24 hours or so due to the fact that storm is, we're getting more confident that this storm is going to track off in that direction. Generally for our weather, the next couple of days, uh, we're expecting today and tomorrow to start experiencing our typical afternoon thunderstorm activity as we start getting in, into uh, that sort of a pattern as this trough dips down into the southeastern portion of the U.S. And as we get into launch day, because the launch time is getting earlier, our chances uh, for the showers are, st are still there, but it's a different situation than what we had the last uh, launch attempt. In this case, now we're going to be dealing with the, f the initial formation of the sea breeze as the sea breeze first forms. We're expecting to start seeing some cumulus clouds develop during that time. Also, we usually uh, get some thunderstorms over the uh, Gulf Stream offshore and the upper level winds where the anvil clouds would come off those thunderstorms um, could be a little bit of a concern as well just because of the fact the anvils could come back in this direction because the winds do have a component from that direction. So we're mainly concerned about two things, the initial development of the sea breeze, the showers, and a chance for isolated showers, and also uh, cumulus clouds, and then the anvil clouds coming in from off the water. So uh, let me go ahead and give you our tanking forecast. Our tanking forecast, we're looking for uh, really good weather, uh, just a slight chance, a very slight chance of having a thunderstorm, but generally just a 5% chance of violating tanking constraints with nice light winds that morning and a temperature of 82 degrees. For our launch forecast, again, the concern, main concern is just those developing showers and also the uh, anvils coming in from off the water. Because of those concerns, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And then our, um, our SRB recovery forecast looks uh, pretty good, not quite as good as the last time, but still generally good weather and nice warm water. The seas are a little bit higher, five to six feet, due to the effects of Tropical Storm Franklin. And the CONUS sites uh, on day one, uh, we do have just a chance for showers at uh, White Sands, and that's the main concern with the CONUS sites. And finally, for the Tau sites, so there is concern for crosswinds at both Maroon uh, and uh, in France as well. If we do happen to delay 24 hours, uh, we basically have the same concerns. It's going to help us uh, gradually over time that the launch time is getting earlier. But our main concern is still the same type of weather, developing showers and the angles coming in from off the water. So again, we have a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And uh, for our CONUS sites on the, for the 24-hour slip, uh, we still have that chance for showers uh, at uh, White Sands. And finally, for the Tau sites, we have concerns for crosswinds at both Marone and at France, and also a chance for showers at Zaragoza. And then if uh, we do happen to delay 40, 48 hours, the launch time getting earlier makes the weather situation a little bit better. And also those winds coming from off the water, those upper level winds that would bring those anvil clouds in, that actually, those winds get a little bit lighter. So because of that, we decrease the probability of Kansas City weather prohibiting launch down to 30%. And, if, uh, and for the Kona sites, uh, the weather is looking good at both sites on, on that day. 
And for the child sites, our main concern is a crosswind and the chance for showers at, uh, or a crosswind, excuse me, for uh, France. So in general, we've been uh, keeping a close eye on Tropical Storm Franklin, but we're starting to uh, get more confident in this northeasterly turn. And uh, weather for launch is uh, basically just going to be concerned about, again, the placement of that sea breeze and uh, the timing of those development of those showers. And all right. Thank on. you, Kathy. We will take questions now. Please give your name and relation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start right here with Bill. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Would you, Pete, would you just review for me uh, what the scrub options are? I mean, uh, Mike Whitmore was telling us, I guess, Wednesday that it was 1-2, stand down, top off the RSD, and 1-2. Sure, Bill. Uh, we do have, uh, again, as I stated, we have 24 and 48 hour uh, scrub turnaround capability. Our going in plan is to try two attempts, stand down, for up to 72 hours to top off both fuel cell commodities, liquid hydrogen and oxygen, and then try two more attempts. Although, as Mike mentioned the other day, we also do have that capability to stand down for 48 hours, top off one commodity, and then uh, make a launch attempt, and then uh, stand up for another 48 hours after that and make a, a top off the additional commodity. Go ahead. Just a quick follow-up. I guess JSC is comfortable with August the 1st anyway. Um, are they, is, is that been finalized, uh, how far this window can go, or are they still talking about that? I understand they're still talking about it, and certainly we'll be uh, discussing it again at the L-2 day uh, management review tomorrow afternoon. Marsha? Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for P. Um, when you went in and did the grounding repairs, how many areas did you find with grounding problems, or how many locations? and uh, how do you know that there aren't more out there? Well, we did we did perform grounding, wire ground repairs on three different locations. Um, we did end up performing uh, electrical resistance and bond checks, and uh, and then successfully completed those, and they passed within specification. We had previously performed several other uh, electrical grounding checks as part of the troubleshooting, and and the only ones that were suspect were these particular three locations. So. At this point, we're confident that the, uh, all the electrical grounds are, uh, are repaired and within specification. Did you find any electromagnetic interference from any of the equipment when you gave them some test runs? When we did the, uh, those electromagnetic interference checks on Thursday, all the results were nominal. Okay. Chris? Uh, Chris Schreiber from Florida today for Pete. Did, were there any other retests that you performed? And also, you talked about uh, system confidence checks. Could you just explain what that means? Sure. Um, at the conclusion of the uh, the pin swap, uh, the connector pin swap that we performed yesterday, and then again after the electrical um, wire checks, we did uh, uh, reinstall this uh, cryo cryogenic simulator box, and we performed what is known as uh, channelization checks just to verify that we had good continuity and we'd see expected signals. And we did complete those. That was, uh, I believe, uh, late last night. Uh, the uh, systems confidence checks I referred to earlier are a standard part of our uh, uh, aft orbiter aft compartment closeout operation in which we bring up all systems and we verify by way of electrical and other uh, scan retests that we have the appropriate continuity and that we don't see any uh, anomalous ind indications after the uh, aft compartment doors are closed for flight. And we do that typically every every mission. And we also did, in fact, perform that uh, prior to the first launch attempt. Jay? Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, Pete, are you convinced that sensor number two is a good sensor now? And uh, second question, uh, does it count again at 1220 or noon straight up? Uh, first off, the countdown does begin. The countdown clock will start counting at noon, high noon uh, local. Um, Secondly, the, the, the battery of testing and analysis that we've done so far, um, I, I understand, leads us to believe that we are confident that we've got good sensors. Of course, uh, the true uh, proof uh, will be when we perform the tanking operation for the launch attempt uh, early Tuesday morning. Uh, but so far, based on what I've, I've understand and been told, we've, we've got good sensor paths and we've got uh, a good point sensor box and we've uh, tested it uh, as exhaustively as we possibly can uh, up to this point. Okay, Bill, you have a follow-up? Hey, just a follow on Marsha's question. I was, I don't under, I'm not sure about the timing of your testing. And the question comes down to, were you able to duplicate any of those EMI signatures before you repaired the grounds? Or did you not ever see anything and you just repaired the grounds and, and by checking everything, the assumption is everything's good? 
really, I believe, Bill, it comes down to B, that we did, uh, we performed the, the EMI checks and we saw no anomalous indications. And after reviewing that data, the uh, troubleshooting team gave us the concurrence to proceed with the, uh, the electrical run repairs. I just want to make sure I understand. You never, nobody ever duplicated uh, that ecosensor anomaly at the pad before you went and fixed the ground. I understand your question. We did not duplicate. That's correct. Okay, Marsha. I had two follow-up questions. The three locations that you fixed, do you, know, do you know offhand specifically what equipment that involved or where these spots were? They were, they were in the vicinity of, of avionics bay 5 and avionics bay 4 in the orbiter aft compartment on the uh, aft 1307 bulkhead location. So we were able to easily access it from our entry-level platform that we had inside the aft compartment. And, and, and a little follow to that before my real follow. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, what um, what was wrong? What, what, could you sort of give a generic explanation as to why these had been grounded improperly? I'm not sure why they were grounded improperly. We were talking about my, uh, the uh, one indication of one ground was that we saw um, on the order of 0.2 milliohms, and the specification allows for 0.1 milliohms. So we're really talking about a very small. Uh, resistance uh, difference, but it was outside of specification. So we went after that one that was out of specification, and then there were two, the other two points were very close to that limit. I don't recall exactly where they're at, but they were on the order of 0.11 or 0.14, I believe. So uh, it was close, and it was, it was being prudent to, to just repair and then repair and verify good bonds. And my understanding is that those bond checks were well within specification after they completed the repairs. And finally, um, could you sort of talk about the testing of the sensors once the tank is full? Are you going to be running extra checks um, on lunch morning? Um, and at what point in the countdown will you be doing that? Okay. Um, we're still developing those plans, and that will be briefed for approval at the mission management team review tomorrow afternoon. But uh, currently the plan, the, trouble, the, the plan for monitoring uh, as is currently laid out is to basically set some simulation, some sim commands to dry on after the, uh, the tank is uh, slow filled up to, to wet the sensors. At that point, then, we'll be in a continuous monitoring mode uh, up until the point we perform the standard uh, sensor checkout at, I believe, two, T minus two and a half hours. And then after that point, we'll set them back again to the, that same monitoring state until the terminal countdown at, during the middle of the T minus nine minute hold. But that's the current plan that's, that's been developed. Certainly we'll uh, have to achieve that concurrence with the uh, presentation of the management team tomorrow. Chris? Uh, yeah, Chris Freiberg. And can you um, refine at what point uh, you've decided it's okay to launch with three working sensors, or are you still kind of working that out? Well, we're still, we're still developing or we're re certainly reviewing and developing that flight rationale. Um, Bottom line is the launch commit criteria remains at 404. Uh, we'll do that management review again tomorrow afternoon, and uh, I believe at that point we'll, we'll discuss and, and decide whether or not it, it is something that we want to really consider on launch day. But uh, at this point, we want to remain at the existing launch commit criteria, and we'll, we'll discuss it further tomorrow. Right, yes, right here. Sorry, right. Doc. Uh, with the space dot comments, we can just repeat. Uh, in addition to your system confidence test that you're planning, I mean, is there anything else in terms of troubleshooting that you're going to be doing remotely once that door is closed to kind of just verify the, the, sex, the checks that you've done? Uh, no, not uh, after we complete these ask to systems confidence checks. There is no other uh, different plan troubleshooting or monitoring besides the, the normal conduct of the countdown. Any other questions? All right, in that event, a couple of programming notes. The next event will be the pickup of the countdown at 12 noon that will be carried live on NASA television. Our next countdown status briefing will be at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And we do have a video file on the Atlantis meeting immediately following this countdown status briefing. Thank you very much.
This is shuttle launch control. We're in firing room three of the launch control center. Final preparations are in work to pick up the launch countdown of STS-114. All personnel who are required to pick up the count were at the call to stations, which occurred about a half an hour ago at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. The countdown will begin at T minus one day, 19 hours. That is the equivalent of T minus 43 hours in the overall countdown, which includes 28 hours of built-in hold time. The count begins approximately 70 hours before the targeted liftoff of Discovery. At launch pad 39B, the aft main engine compartment of Discovery has been closed out and the orbiter flight doors have been installed for launch. Meanwhile, the astronaut schedule today includes some time at the launch pad doing some pre-flight inspections of Space Shuttle Discovery. Also, Commander Eileen Collins he is flying the shuttle training aircraft at the shuttle landing facility where she arrived in the T-38 yesterday at this time. And the astronauts will be going to bed this afternoon at 3.30 and be awakened tonight at 11.30 p.m. On Sunday, the commander and the pilot will fly the shuttle training aircraft once again, and the entire crew will have their medical examinations. The gantry light rotating service structure that provides the primary access and weather protection is scheduled to be retracted at 1.30 p.m. on Monday, and will be followed by configuring the switches in Discovery's cockpit for launch. Standing by now to pick up the countdown for STS-114 in five seconds, three seconds. The countdown has begun for Space Shuttle Discovery and STS-114, targeted for liftoff at 10.39 a.m. on Tuesday. Now that the countdown has begun, the preparations for loading the cryogenic reactants are starting. These will be used by Discovery to generate power during the 12-day mission. This operation to load liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the storage spheres located beneath the orbiter's payload bay will begin at 8 a.m. on Sunday. On launch day, loading the external tank with over 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants will begin at 12.40 a.m. The astronauts will also be awakened at about this time for breakfast. They'll later have a light lunch at 5 a.m., and this will immediately be followed by suit-up. They are scheduled to depart for the launch pad at 6.49 a.m. Weather-wise, on launch day, there is a 40% chance of not meeting the launch weather criteria due to the start of forming thunderstorms or associated cloud conditions with thunderstorms. At launch time, the temperature will be near 84 degrees, Relative humidity 75%, the wind southeasterly at 7 to 10 knots, and a visibility of 7 miles or greater. Once again, the countdown for Space Shuttle Discovery has begun. It began on schedule at exactly 12 noon, leading to liftoff at 10.39 a.m. on Tuesday. There are no significant technical issues in work at this time, and Discovery now is being readied for a 12-day mission to the International Space Station. This is Shuttle Launch Control. Shuttleflüge bleiben riskant, das zeigt uns jetzt die Discovery Mission schon vor dem Start. Das Fluggerät ist ein getunter Oldtimer, wie es in einer Überschrift hieß, aber noch immer ist der Space Truck enorm wichtig für die US Raumfahrt, auch wenn das ganze System eigentlich schon altertümlich wirkt. Die Entwicklung geht ja bis in die 60er Jahre zurück. Zeit für einen Rückblick. Five. Im April 1981 hob das Space Shuttle zum ersten Mal ins All ab. Es ging aus Entwicklungsversuchen hervor, den Weltraum ohne Raketen zu erreichen. Aus dieser Zeit stammt auch die Abkürzung STS für Space Transportation System. Arbeitshöhe bis zu 300 Kilometer. Die Länge 
40 Meter Spannweite, 24 Meter der Raumtransporter, fast die Ladung eines Eisenbahnwaggons, 30 Tonnen. Hitzekacheln am Rumpf schützen den Orbiter vor der Reibungshitze beim Wiedereintritt in die Atmosphäre. Ein riesiger zigarrenförmiger Gastank mit 2 Millionen Litern flüssigem Wasserstoff und Sauerstoff versorgt das Raumschiff beim Start. Die Kabine hat zwei Stockwerke, das Flugdeck und das Mitteldeck. Beim Start helfen zwei zusätzliche Feststoffraketen. Die Schubkraft entspricht 40 Millionen PS. Das Raumschiff besteht aus Millionen Einzelteilen. Im Cockpit befinden sich 1000 Schalter und Knöpfe. Geflogen wird normalerweise mit einer siebenköpfigen Besatzung. Ein Startabbruch ist jederzeit denkbar. Bei uns im Jahre 1993 wurde drei Sekunden vorher abgebrochen. Das heißt also, die Antriebe liefen schon. Wasserstoff war auf die Plattform ausgetreten. Das ist eine äußerst ungemütliche Situation, weil man weiß, dass dann wirklich der ganze Shuttle explodieren kann. Das war jetzt weit vorher. Das war noch eine sehr sichere Situation. Aber nichtsdestotrotz, es kann immer wieder während des Countdowns passieren. Der Countdown dauert drei Tage. Da wird wirklich, wirklich jedes Teil gecheckt. Und wenn nur irgendwas nicht in Ordnung ist, dann wird angehalten. Und hier war es ja genauso. Schauen Sie, wir hatten vier Sensoren. Eine davon ist defekt. Im Prinzip zeigen die anderen drei noch die richtigen Werte an. Also die NASA hätte gut starten können, aber sie ist jetzt übervorsichtig und sagt, wir lassen, wir lassen nichts auf uns aufkommen, sondern wir stoppen, warten lieber, tauschen ihn aus. Das ist ein riesiger Aufwand. Was geht da in einem selbst vor? Man hat ja sicherlich auch so einen innerlichen Countdown. Das kann ich Ihnen genau sagen. Sie sitzen da drin oder Sie liegen ja da drin. Sie liegen auf dem Rücken, warten, Sie schauen wirklich auf die Uhr und sagen, so, jetzt sind es nur noch zwei Stunden. Und dann kommt so ein Call und heißt so, ihr könnt wieder aufsteigen. Und Sie sind in einem Anzug, der ist luftdicht, da schwitzt Sie drin. Ja, dann kommen Sie wieder raus und Sie wissen, Sie müssen die ganze Prozedur noch mal durchmachen. Das ist ziemlich enttäuschend. Beim Wiedereintritt in die Atmosphäre erhitzt sich die Unterseite des Gleiters auf 1700 Grad. Von fünf Fähren sind noch drei einsatzklar. Atlantis, Discovery und Endeavour. Das Shuttle wurde als Transporter entwickelt, um Lasten in eine Erdumlaufbahn zu bringen und die Raumstation mit Bauteilen zu beliefern. Bei Ausweichlandungen in Kalifornien muss der Orbiter Huckepack per Jumbo zurück nach Florida geflogen werden. Noch 18 Missionen soll die Fährenflotte absolvieren. Ein Startabbruch kann auch in Zukunft immer drohen. Und der könnte vielleicht so knapp sein, dass die Astronauten nur eine Chance haben, Rettung per Gondel noch am Startturm. Bleibt noch Zeit für eine Evakuierung am Boden, sieht sie so aus. Die siebenköpfige Besatzung löst die Gurte, sprengt die Einstiegsluke und rennt über die Brücke in Rettungsgondeln. Insgesamt sieben Stück gibt es davon. Dann rasen sie Richtung Sicherheit, Richtung Bunker. Sollte die Raumfähre erst im All in Schwierigkeiten geraten und nicht mehr zurückkehren können, würde die Besatzung in der Raumstation auf ein zweites Rettungsshuttle warten müssen. Die ersten und die letzten 100 Meilen sind das gefährlichste bei einem Shuttleflug. Übernimmt den Start noch, der Autopilot sieht es bei der Landung anders aus. Hier muss der Kommandant zeigen, was er kann. Der Wiedereintritt erfolgt durch den Autopiloten, aber der Kommandant kann jederzeit das Manöver übernehmen. Der Hitzeschild muss die Reibungshitze der Luft aufnehmen. Es entstehen Temperaturen wie bei einem Schneidbrenner. Ein Riss im Schild bedeutet ein Fiasko für Schiff und Besatzung. In der Bodenkontrolle hofft man, dass alles gut geht. Spätestens sechs Minuten vor der Landung übernimmt der Kommandant dann die Fähre, die wie ein großes Segelflugzeug Richtung Cape Canaveral gleitet. Erst eine Minute vor dem Aufsetzen sehen Pilot und co die Landebahn. Die Landung eine extreme fliegerische Herausforderung. Down and locked. 
Die Landegeschwindigkeit beträgt 350 bis 370 km pro Stunde. Die Landebahn ist 5 km lang. Ausweichplätze gibt es in Dijon, in Frankreich und in Spanien. Auch auf dem Flughafen Köln-Bonn könnte der Raumgleiter aufsetzen. Der Bremsfallschirm lässt den Koloss auf der 5 km langen Piste irgendwann zum Stehen kommen. Wegen der Gefahr giftiger Gasentwicklungen bleibt die Besatzung nach der Landung noch im ausgerollten Raumschiff sitzen. Außerdem geht die Besatzung die Checkliste durch, trinkt und gewöhnt sich mit Übungen an die Schwerkraft. Ist alles okay, nähert sich dann die Bodenmannschaft. In einem Werbespot verlegte man eine Space Shuttle Landung in eine Großstadt. In dem kurzen Film geht es um die realistische Fernsehbild- und Tondarstellung zu Hause auf dem Sofa. Der Zauber der Inszenierung kam dabei komplett aus dem Computer. Anders als in der Werbung hat eine Raumfähre nur eine Chance zu landen. Space Shuttles sind Auslaufmodelle. In fünf Jahren sollen sie ins Museum, wenn sie alle Bauteile zur Raumstation gebracht haben. Doch was kommt dann? Längst entwickeln Ingenieure ein neues System für Raumfahrer, ein Milliardengeschäft und ein neuer Impuls für die Hochtechnologie. Four, three, two, one, one. Delta Clipper hieß ein Prototyp von McDonnell Douglas Mitte der 90er Jahre. Eine einstufige, wiederverwendbare Trägerrakete. Die Landung war immer ein Desaster. Das aufrechte Aufsetzen klappte bei den beiden Prototypen nicht. Sie explodierten. Das Programm wurde daraufhin eingestellt. Eine private Raumfahrtfirma will die Technologie nun weiterentwickeln. Amazon-Gründer Jeff Bezos will die Rakete bauen lassen. Ende nächsten Jahres soll es in Texas erste Testflüge damit geben. Auch die Russen entwickeln ein Nachfolgemodell für die Soyuz-Rakete. Ihr Modell heißt Clipper. Die Europäische Raumfahrtagentur interessiert sich dafür. Clipper könnte als Mannschafts- oder als Trägerrakete eingesetzt werden. Vielleicht starten damit einst ESA-Astronauten vom Europäischen Weltraumbahnhof in französisch Guyana. Nach 2010 will die USA ein neues Raketensystem für bemannte Flüge haben. Lockheed und Boeing buhlen um den milliardenschweren Auftrag, über den frühestens kommendes Jahr entschieden werden wird. Das sogenannte Mannschaftstransportfluggerät soll Menschen zum Mond und vielleicht zum Mars bringen. We want to take a look now at the international weather forecast. Our Fritz Navos is standing by at the weather center with all of that. Fritz. Hello there, Rosemary. We're watching a couple of uh, uh, a cluster of clouds into the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. Particularly, uh, you can see near the Yucatan Peninsula, that cluster of clouds is a tropical disturbance. Uh, we call it a tropical wave. This is the first stage of development, and uh, it's getting better organized and uh, pushing a lot of rainfall activity into the uh, Yucatan Peninsula. And that has the potential of uh, uh, getting better organized over the next few days and even uh, become a tropical system uh, pushing over the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, so we're going to keep a very close eye 
rely on it. But also, uh, we're still looking at uh, Tropical Storm uh, Franklin. You can see it right here north of uh, the uh, Bahamas. The good news is it is uh, moving away from the east coast of the United States, and uh, it's uh, also pushing to the west-northwest. But it is getting better organized. Uh, the winds have been strengthening over the past few days, and you can see it right here. And uh, it has the potential of uh, getting some uh, pretty strong winds. Uh, we're talking about winds nearing hurricane force, meaning uh, winds near 100 or 100, 120 kilometers per hour, but not expected to become a full hurricane. Uh, but uh, the potential is there for it to continue to develop over the area and move away from the coast, but uh, pushing very close to Bermuda in about 72 hours. So we're going to keep a very close eye on that system. Here's the latest on it. You can see the winds near 72 kilometers uh, per hour and moving to the northwest at 14 kilometers per hour. That's all we have for now. Let's go back to Rosemary.